so responsible when it comes to responding and keeping up with trends, generating and impacting youth. As I speak, there are new technological innovations such as NFTs, non-fungible tokens, cryptocurrencies, and many others. I'm interested in knowing how much scientific research and policies are exploring such areas. I would not be surprised if there are none in the region. But I'm sure there are some young people who are already exploring that space. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I challenge my colleagues to explore ways to bring research and policy development to these trends. The SAREC AAP Youth Dialogue is certainly a step in the right direction. Dialogue must be at the heart of the research and policy development. That, ladies and gentlemen, will enable us to keep up with trends that young people are driving. It will also enable us to constantly update our curriculum and programming so that we remain ever relevant. I strongly believe that this dialogue will give us the opportunity to strengthen innovation hubs, think tanks, and centers of excellence that are easily accessible to youth. Colleagues, we must not resist the ongoing disruptions. Rather, we must join the disruption movements with the youth in order to support them learn from them, and mentor them towards a brighter future. We must challenge ourselves and reduce the bureaucracy within our institutions. We must facilitate the most brilliant ideas and make it easy for youth to do networking. Most importantly, as a regional bloc, we must create partnerships that will enable cross-border funding for research and entrepreneurship. There's no better way to do that than to start with a resource that we have trusted for years, which is SADC. May I implore participants to this dialogue to move beyond the talk and to walk the walk by identifying concrete interventions that will lead towards impactful outcomes amongst the youth. As institutions of higher learning and research, we have the capacity to generate knowledge and evidence that is able to lead towards impactful outcomes amongst young men and women in this region. Why am I saying so? It is the young women, young men that are dominating or that are the dominating voice in our region, and therefore we must listen to them. I think we should not fool ourselves that uh, should we not create a conducive environment for nurturing the talent of these young people, we'll find ourselves in real trouble. The young people are getting agitated because they feel that they have the talents, they have the skills that are not being important. UB, together with the AAP, fully supports an agenda that places youth at the center of policy development. We therefore trust that we will ensure that with our partners here, we will listen and respond to the outcomes of this dialogue. It is our collective desire that SADC will see universities as partners in shaping the SADC we collectively want. Once again, Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to UB. I trust that you will dialogue, you will network, you will co-create solutions to the challenges young men and women across the Sadek region are facing. I thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Norris, from, for those warm welcome uh, remarks. And ladies and gentlemen, not only is protocol um, observed, but 
We are still in the times of COVID-19 and therefore we will continue observing COVID-19 protocols and it is um, quite important that I do mention that. Um, like I said, Professor Norris mentioned a key word um, within his welcome remarks being trendsetters. And I'd like to say trendsetters such as the Director of Youth Affairs in the Office of the President of uh, the Republic of South Africa, Dr. Bernice Kagala, as well as uh, trendsetters such as the Founder and Managing Director of GBRI Business Solutions Tanzania. I did uh, mention the fact that diversity is key to the sustainability of the solutions that we will discuss to the problems um, that we face as young people. The other um, area of note uh, in his warm um, welcome remarks is the fact that creating the enabling environment and listening to the youth voice. I would like to attest that uh, as a team member in the office of the Vice Chancellor at the University of Botswana, as a young person, um, Professor Norris knows exactly um, what that means in, in terms of listening um, to a young person. So um, just a round of applause for that, um, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure uh, of welcoming um, to the podium uh, Professor Richard Mkandawiri, um, the director of the African Alliance uh, for Partnerships, uh, Alliance, African Alliance for, for Partnerships, to share with us um, on the program and the objectives of why uh, we are gathered here um, this morning um, and course over the, the, the course of two days. Professor Mkandawiri, you are welcome. Thank you so much. And let us give him a youthful um, round of applause. I do feel that. Thank you very much. Uh, we can have a bit more of that. Thank you, lady. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Director of our programs. Uh, we're very delighted to be around the University of Botswana, and uh, I would like to pay my respects to the Honorable Assistant uh, Minister for Higher Education, Science and Technology. And also, we're delighted that uh, SADC uh, has been able to support this uh, gathering here and uh, we welcome, of course, the representative of SADAC, uh, Madame Melani, and uh, obviously the Vice Chancellor, we're extremely delighted uh, for your remarks, but uh, your commitment to working with uh, these institutions of higher learning, but also working very closely with uh, colleagues uh, working in the youth ecosystem. Uh, would like to thank uh, the European Union for its continued uh, commitment to supporting uh, not just uh, Botswana, but uh, supporting the rest of the continent within the context of all the European Union, uh, you know, e European Union uh, cooperation. Uh, we are very, very grateful. Uh, and uh, also we're delighted that uh, the African uh, Development Bank um, is actually going to be joining us shortly. Uh, I believe that she should be here already, Dr. Uh, Martha Piri. Uh, very welcome, the director of uh, uh, human capital, uh, youth skills uh, development from ADB. Uh, it's very, very delighted that uh, ADB, you know, is around. Indeed, uh, we are aware that uh, uh, Dr. Akina Disina is a passionate believer in the energy and creativity of young people, and uh, his commitment uh, to, um, you know, nurture young people, as we'll be hearing, I is unquestionable. So we're, we're extremely delighted. We, as our Alliance for African uh, Partnership, um, which uh, is composed of, uh, uh, of uh, 10 universities, plus also 11 research institutes uh, in East and Southern Africa, as well as uh, West Africa. Uh, we have actually l positioned youth as a central uh, entry point for our conversation. Uh, we're aware, all of us, that uh, you know, over the years, uh, youth conversations have been at uh, the center of uh, you know, debates uh, around the continent at the regional economic community level, at the continent level, as well as at the uh, global level. And I think as we, we heard, uh, evidently, uh, you know, it, it's been a talk and no implementation has uh, taken place. 
And uh, as the Alliance for African Arab Partnership, uh, which is actually committed to the future of our um, you know, people, uh, we felt that uh, we need to get into some practical uh, interventions, begin to define those. And uh, it's for this reason that uh, we began conversations with uh, the Secretariat, uh, including the uh, SADC Executive Secretary. We engaged it, um, you know, in um, some of his visits um, in Malawi. Um, I'm from Malawi, um, where I also chair the National Planning Commission. So it was also within the context of that, that uh, you know, what is the future of a country like Malawi uh, in terms of uh, you know, the participation of young people into that future? Do we give them a chance to define that future? And uh, we're delighted that uh, you know, the executive secretary has demonstrated passion and commitment to be supportive to the definition of key interventions that uh, might actually uh, drive a new uh, youth uh, empowerment uh, agenda. And um, we would like to, 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 to express, therefore, our appreciation. We hope that uh, at some stage we'll be meeting uh, the executive secretary uh, to give him an indication of the outcomes from uh, this uh, uh, co conversation. So, in our case, therefore, you know, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we we definitely want to move beyond uh, uh, conversations uh, which are, are taking place here. There is a scoping work which was uh, undertaken by colleagues from uh, institutions of uh, higher learning. And within that uh, scoping work, which will be presented so sometime you know, uh, today, uh, you will see that uh, there are quite a few uh, indications of uh, concrete areas which uh, our national governments, as well as the private sector, uh, could actually you know, open up for deepening youth participation in mainstream uh, e economy. And uh, that piece of work, however, has gaps. Uh, and, uh, it is our belief that uh, information is important, but uh, it should not just be sake for gathering information. Uh, so we are hoping that uh, through the courtesies of our SADC Secretariat and indeed the courtesies of uh, our partners, uh, we will actually you know, begin to really generate more knowledge, more information um, within the context of uh, the participation of youth to move towards a mainstream e economy. And um, I'm sure, you know, that would include the document of uh, successful models. How based at, at the regional level do we really begin to share some of those uh, successful models? But more fundamentally, I think what we're seeing across the region uh, in the among different countries is uh, the mismatch between uh, what the job market demands and what we produce as universities or institutions of higher learning. Uh, to what extent do we have an understanding of what, you know, the industry wants out there? Uh, it's surprising, I believe, that, uh, you know, we see, you know, hundreds of uh, young people across the region, if not thousands, who graduate from our universities and yet, you know, they are unemployed or indeed they get into the informal sector where they're subjected to a whole range of, uh, you know, very difficult circumstances. There are quite a few of the young people even gathered here who are university graduates and have decided they will actually just, you know, run their own enterprises because the job market, you know, is not able to accommodate them. Um, you know, so we need, I think, to, to, to really get a, into a deep dive in uh, understanding, you know, what's actually going on the, on the ground. And uh, we are, you know, very hopeful, therefore, that, uh, you know, the partners, uh, including, by the way, uh, the private sector, will come to the table uh, to explore how do we really move together uh, in terms of uh, being supportive to the young people uh, within this region so that they truly become part of uh, uh, the mainstream economy. They, they, they become really the drivers of um, you know, a new uh, SADC, the SADC we want. They begin to define you know, what the future will look like. One of the concerns I think most of us have is that uh, whether as governments or indeed as uh, NGOs, we tend to support these cottage industries. You know, we tend to placate youth and cajole them and uh, give them handouts, you know, 
we don't see you know some real credible businesses emerging from the sweep of young people you know there's no reason why in this region we cannot see a group of young people r running their own you know conglomerate of supermarkets you know running their own silicon valley type of uh, you know uh, enterprise there's no reason whatsoever i think it takes bold decisions. it takes uh, you know strong leaders to really say we are committed to supporting young people to become really the future middle class of our region uh, and if we move with that kind of uh, ambition um, you know it can be doable it can be done uh, the question is one of who is there to come to the table to ensure that uh, these young people are not just used as uh, instruments for political you know control or they're used as instruments for advancing um, you know primordial or ethnic loyalties I mean, which we've seen in a number of uh, uh, countries uh, happening you know this region but uh, across the continent our appeal therefore colleagues uh, ladies and gentlemen including the young people who are gathered here i think let's be a little more radical you know i think we're not innovative enough to be able to say you know these young people can actually run you know big enterprises these young people can become the future capitalists or the future middle class of uh, our continent and I think this is the time, and SADA can lead the way. And I'd like to assure you, uh, Madam Representative of the SADC Secretariat, that uh, the thought leaders who are gathered here, including the young people, are prepared to take a very radical reflection and begin to define radical interventions that will be transformative, that will actually lead towards uh, the SADC we all want. And we trust, therefore, that. Uh, who come to the table as SADAC and we as uh, institutions of higher learning, as institutions uh, dealing with research, and indeed as uh, groups of uh, young people who are already moving in this direction, will actually you know, receive your support. But at the same time, we trust that uh, our partners, ADB, European Union, and other multilateral as well as bilateral institutions will come to our support as we begin to shape up the SADAC we want. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mkandawiri, Director of uh, Alliance for African Partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a community not only congregated here this morning, but due to COVID, there could only be a certain number of us, but this event is being broadcasted live on, on various digital platforms, one of them being the Alliance for African Partnerships social media pages, being Facebook and YouTube. So I am speaking to our virtual audience this morning that uh, please do continually engage as there will be uh, various discussions uh, throughout our program this morning. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to share them. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mkandawiri. You spoke um, something that was uh, quite important. Um, you spoke of we must move from awareness to accountability. And I believe that the, the trendsetters um, this morning and the leaders uh, that are doing the great work socially and economically being the young people throughout uh, the SIDAC region and throughout the continent um, uh, definitely will be calling for more of that. Um, on um, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, um, ecosystem, the, the national innovation ecosystem is quite integral to the sustainability of the products and services um, that we as young people not only create, um, but are able to commercialize, not only within um, uh, our research institutions, our universities, but as well as from the market. And the ecosystem is fundamental to supporting um, you know, a, a product, a prototype from the lab that goes out into the market and, and create um, that s solution. And the reason why I mention this is uh, because of our next speaker uh, from the European Union who um, have uh, been gracious enough as well to uh, fund um, this gathering, but more importantly, be a partner in supporting that uh, fundamental ecosystem that we speak about. So ladies and gentlemen, with a round 
uh, of applause. I will welcome the Uni European Union uh, representative, um, you know, to share with us uh, this morning some remarks. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Director of Ceremonies, uh, Your Excellency, Assistant uh, Minister of Higher Education, uh, Science and Technology, Madhuru Tsile Simelane, Director of Social and Human Development at the SADC Secretariat, Professor Makanda Wire, Director of the Alliance for African Partnership, and Professor David Norris, uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, media here present, good morning to all. Bonjour, bon dia, du melang bachetso. On behalf of the European Union, I am really pleased to be here today and deliver these short opening remarks uh, in this dialogue organized under the uh, umbrella of the EU-funded program entitled Enhancing Cooperation and Dialogue for Regional Integration, the SADC Dialogue Facility. The European Union is a firm believer of the benefits that regional integration can bring to ensure peace, economic, and social prosperity for the people. This is why the EU supports and promotes regional integration in Southern Africa and in other parts of the world. We also believe that promoting and facilitating dialogues on public policies and reforms is a, key en is a key enabler to advance on development objectives. Dialogues should be inclusive and incorporate a wide, wide range of stakeholders. So I'm very pleased that uh, in this dialogue we will benefit from the use of the government, from the use of the private sector, of course from the academia, and how not from the voices of the youth, enabling a critical discussion on youth empowerment and entrepreneurship in SADC. Ladies and gentlemen, two years have now passed since the COVID-19 pandemic hit us all, causing so much social and economic disruption and triggering unprecedented responses policy responses all over the world, including in Southern Africa and in the European Union. COVID-19 has affected our social and work patterns, but luckily most of us managed to pull through despite the challenges. However, for many others, the pandemic has had a huge impact. Since the topic of the dialogue is youth empowerment, I think it is fair to think today, in particular, in the millions of young people throughout the globe and here in Southern Africa who were and continue to be proportionally affected by the impact of COVID-19 as they try to continue their education, enter the job market, and make new acquaintances. But the good news is that we are finally seeing clear signs of return to a certain normality, as many restrictions are being lifted progressively. The fact that we are all able to meet here today is a clear sign that I'm sure we all very much welcome. And as we return to normality, I believe, I believe it is fair to praise our young people for having accepted and supported 19 restrictions out of solidarity. Now it should be their time to flourish. Ladies and gentlemen, the importance of youth empowerment cannot be overemphasized. The future of our nations and regions lies in the hands of its youth. The more we empower our youth today, the brighter tomorrow our nations will witness. The world today is very young. It is home to 1.2 billion young people aged 15 to 24, representing the largest young generation in history. There are high geographic disparities, with Africa leading in the number of young men and women worldwide. In fact, three quarters of Africa's population is below 35, and over 60% are below the age of 25. Yet young people across the world are facing similar chal challenges linked to the areas such as job creation and labor markets, globalization, governance, or the impact of climate change. More than one-fifth of young people are not in employment, education, or training, and the global youth unemployment rate of almost 14% is three times higher as that of adults, with young women being the most vulnerable. Ladies and gentlemen, inequality can push young people into political apathy, radicalization, irregular migration, or crime. But at the same time, young generations represent a key actor for change and development. We have already seen the increasing leadership role of youth in fighting climate change, advancing digital entrepreneurship, and demanding sound democratic governance. 
young people can and are already providing novel solutions to today's challenges. The inclusion of young people is both a challenge and an opportunity for international cooperation and for our regional and national development policies. Tapping into this potential and supporting young women and men is key for sustainable development. In the last years, youth engagement and empowerment has climbed to the top of international development priorities. A number of key policy papers recognize youth as fully-fledged partners in reaching the sustainable development goals, while others are settling or have settled their focus on youth, making a new era for young people. The topic of youth, with an emphasis on young women and girls, is also gaining increasing importance in EU policy. The European Union recognizes the importance of young people well-being, development, engagement, and participation in society. That is why it has launched so many youth programs and initiatives over time, such as the well-known and popular Erasmus Plus Exchange Program. It is also worth noting that the EU declared 2022 the European Year of Youth, shining a light on the importance of youth to build a better future, greener, more inclusive, and digital. And also as a recogni recognition of the sacrifices that young people have made during the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU is the world's largest provider of development assistance, and through its programs, the EU promotes the meaningful inclusion and active par participation of youth at all levels of society, the economy, and politics. In the Southern African region, the EU has been working for decades, promoting peace and security, environmental sustainability, trade, fostering investments, and providing economic opportunities, with a particular emphasis on the youth. The EU has contributed more than 415 million euros in the last two decades to advance the regional integration agenda in Southern Africa. And this does not take into account the specific country programs in the six SADC member states. In the EU, we believe that we can only address the challenges of the 21st century by building a stronger, more diverse, and inclusive partnership. And in these partnerships, we want and we need to hear the voices of young people to make sure that policies and services are fit for those who will use them. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I wish you success for the exchanges you're about to have in the next couple of days and commend you all for your engagement and commitment towards regional integration and the promotion of youth empowerment. You have our highest respect and you can count on the European Union as a long-standing long partner in the Southern African region. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you for, 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 for those uh, remarks. Um, you did mention um, the aspect of regional integration and uh, as I introduce my, our next speaker um, from SADC, uh, being the Director of Social and Human, De Human Development, um, Me uh, Simulani, um, to share with us from the SADC perspective in terms of um, um, their, their contribution as well as support uh, for us um, throughout these two days and more importantly going forward um, as we end to convene uh, tomorrow. Messi Melanie, you're welcome. Thank you, Program Director, for the opportunity. I'd like to recognize the Honorable uh, Re Lesasso, who is the Assistant Minister of Tertiary Education, Research, Science, and Technology, Professor R David Norris, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana, uh, Professor Richard Mkandawiri, who is the Director for the AAP and the Chairperson of this dialogue. I also wish to recognize in a special way uh, the guest of honor, Dr. Martha Piri of the African Development Bank, representatives, representative of the EU delegation to Botswana and to SADC uh, for sponsoring this meeting, this dialogue, esteemed resource persons in our midst, 
distinguished youth delegates who are quite important and critical for this uh, dialogue, ladies and gentlemen and members of the media, a very good morning to you all. It is a great pleasure for me to make some few remarks on behalf of the SPADAC Secretariat, a very important dialogue on youth empowerment through employment and entrepreneurship development in SPADAC. Our Executive Secretary, uh, Honorable, excuse me, His Excellency Mahosi, is unable to join this meeting this morning, but he sends his regards to this gathering. I wish to express express the Secretariat's appreciation for the support received from all the partners who contributed to the successful planning of this event, including the Alliance for African Partnership and the University of Botswana, uh, among others. I also wish to express our appreciation of support received from the European Union through the SADC Dialogue Facility. This facility uh, was set up to contribute to the implementation of the SADAC Regional Integration Agenda by supporting effective policy dialogues around key thematic areas of importance uh, to this agenda. It supports policy making processes, consultations, and interactions, and will be instrumental in strengthening links between SADAC and stakeholders in Africa and beyond. Distinguished ladies um, and gentlemen, uh, Africa has the world's youngest population, and therefore youth will significantly determine Africa's growth, Africa's growth trajectory and its impact on the global economy. The youth offer an important opportunity for economic transformation if the talents and skills are developed channeled and channeled me, and channeled uh, into productive employment. Conversely, if the plight of young people is not addressed, it could lead to chronic and pervasive unemployment and or underemployment, further le leading to disillusionment. And Youth empowerment and participation is therefore one of the key intervention areas in SADAC's regional initiative strategic development plan, which is RISDP 2020 to 2030. The objective is to have a youth demographic in the SADAC region that is skilled and empowered to fully benefit from, participate in, and drive social economic development, regional integration, and political discourse. Key interventions identified in the RISDP, which SADAC will focus on in the period of this RISDP, which is 2020-2030, but are not limited to the following. One, institutionalization of the SADAC Youth Forum and a uh, youth secretariat, and a youth, sec youth secretariat. This forum is to serve as the key convening platform uh, on new issues, as well as to address the challenge of a fragmented response. Further to this, SADAC endeavors to ensure that member states implement, monitor regionally agreed programs through the national youth councils, through the national youth councils. We are already working with the United Nations uh, Population Fund partners to ensure that the National Youth Councils are fit for purpose to play the coordination at the national, at the national level and work on the assessment of the capacities of National Youth Councils has taken place in the SADAC region and recommendations on strengthening NYCs, as we no normally call them, are being implemented at national level. Our other aspiration as a spouse in the RISDP 2020-2030 is the establishment of youth internship and volunteer programs. This will require resourcing of the SADAC Secretariat to be able to undertake this responsibility. And we look on to our partners who are present, but also those who probably will not be present in this room to help us 
uh, put these uh, processes in place. Policy interventions on small initiation, uh, growth, and sustainability uh, one of the plans that we have under the RISDP in order to stimulate employment and entrepreneurship opportunities for young people. In addition, empowerment of youth through targeted social, economic, and technological development initiatives will remain Im important and critical as we, as we chart the way forward within uh, the, on the youth. We also recognize the importance of youth in health youth in climate change, and also recognize the gender disparities and stereotypes that still exist, which we need to break in order for the youth to be able to, 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 to go forward. We need to create that enabling environment that breaks these gender stereotypes. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we call for a holistic and multi-sectoral approach, which entails collaboration and partnership among stakeholders to ensure synergy in addressing the challenges facing young people. This dialogue, therefore, is part of the conversation in the SADC region to spearhead a multi-stakeholder approach to solving young people's pro problems in all their multi-dimensional uh, complexities. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, in concluding my remarks, I wish to pledge uh, on behalf of the SADC Secretariat the continued support uh, in advancing the youth agenda in SADC. We are also committed to continue uh, these dialogues with uh, academia as, as this is one of the uh, first uh, dialogues we are having with um, the academic community. But we are also interested and keen to working more closely with other think tanks and other sectors to push the uh, agenda forward. I also want to thank you very much for participating in this dialogue uh, amidst your busy schedule. I hope the session will be informative and will identify solutions uh, to some of the existing impediments to youth empowerment in the region. We will continue, as I said, to organize similar dialogues in the future, and the aim is for the recommendations to inform decision making, but also programs which are cutting edge, which will make a difference to the young people in, in the region. With these remarks, I wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you, merci beaucoup, obrigado. Asante ni sana, kia lewo. Thank you, uh, Member Similani, for those remarks. And I am going to uh, ask for another round of applause because, Ms. Similani, yes, please, we, uh, may, we, may we do go ahead. And I really have to note this, uh, uh, Mr. Milani, you mentioned a very key important point about uh, issues of gender and gender bias that um, uh, um, possibly take us uh, a few steps back in moving forward. And I will, I did ask for that, uh, 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 for that round of applause, extra round of applause, because she is the only female in our this morning, or, or one of two. Um, rather, should I say, um, this morning for the official opening. So, Honorable Minister, um, I, I appeal to you that the next time you are in a, in a, in a panel or a program where you see that one gender is not represented as the other, um, you will make note of that and, and request that uh, we have a more balanced uh, uh, program. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> but on that note, uh, I'd like to... Uh, in, um, the Honorable Assistant Minister of Tertiary Education Research and Technology. And just before he comes um, to the stage, uh, and I invite him as he addresses uh, us in terms of the official opening, I must note that uh, I grew up about uh, 15 kilometers um, from, from, from his, he's the area 
a member of um, from his constituency um, in a little village, or should I say, well, village um, being the fact that th that is where I'm from. However, uh, most of the time, weekends uh, from school, we used to go to the cattle post in a little settlement called Tho Tobani, um, Rede Sasso. And as Mayor Similani spoke about the National Youth Councils, I believe, um, remind that uh, we will have um, this further dialogue, um, not only in Tobane, not only in Mahalape, in Shoshong as well, um, uh, Rele Sasso. But ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, may we welcome the Assistant Minister of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology uh, to uh, officiate as he delivers the official Thank you so much. Um, um, uh, nice. I'll not go into introducing each one of us here. Into my of this day, the guest of honor, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by extending a warm welcome to each and every one of our distinguished guests here present, to the youth assembled here and those from across the African continent who are joining us through the live stream, and to every individual present in this, in this room today. I am honored to open this dialogue at this critical juncture in world affairs with uncertainty resulting from the around the world and everything that is happening around us. It is easy to forget that we have long-standing challenges, including poverty and social stagnation amongst our youth. The static AAP dialogue on youth empowerment has therefore come at the right time to allow us to deliberate on possible solutions to the youth, the question in the context of the challenge that confront our nations, the African continent, and the world at large. Our economies have taken a battle in this past three years owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has set back the steady strides of our economies, the steady strides our economies had, ma had been making before COVID-19. It has made it even more difficult to address outstanding social challenges. The social and economic situation among our youth and women and men remains dire. In Botswana, youth unemployment rate that is the share of the labor market force of age between 15 and 24 without work but available for seeking employment is high. The situation is similar across many countries. Even though young people constitute the majority of Africa's population, the youth population accounts for the majority of the unemployed at 60%. It is important to note that studies have shown that young people feel the sting of unemployment even more sharply. We therefore need concerted and concrete efforts from everyone in government, the, the academia, the private sector, civil society organizations, and other sectors of the society. I am particularly happy to know that for this event to come to fruition, it has taken the joint efforts of many parties, including SADC, the Alliance for African Partnership, and University of Botswana. We must, we must never underestimate the power of working together. The effort to empower and envelop our youth requires efforts from multiple points, including education, sexual and reproductive health, physical and mental health, vocational training, and skills development. It must therefore be clear to by now that Africa's ability to harness the youth dividends and sustainable development on the continent are contingent on the extent to which African governments and other sectors of society are willing to work together towards the transformation of our nations. As the government of Botswana and as the Minister of Tertiary Education, we are open to collaborate with partners from within and from across the, our borders. I would like to finish with one word of advice about how we approach our efforts towards youth empowerment. 
as government, academia, academics, and others, we must shake away the tendency of, of attempting to solve the problems of the youth for them. We should appreciate the youth have the ability to generate solutions in response to the multiple problems we face or they face. We should therefore be asking the youth how we can support them in solving their problems and how they can help us solve other social problems. This speaks to issues of inclusion. How do we incorporate the voices of the youth in our planning and implementation of youth-focused interventions? It's also about approaching youth as a resource with the ideas and their energy and their skills. As with the rest of the world, Africa and our own countries, as with the rest of the world, Africa and our own countries are undergoing a period of fundamental change. Young people should be at the center of the quest for solutions. With this few remarks, allow me to thank SADC, the AAP, and the University of Botswana for bringing us together at this incredible moment to discuss this important topic. I trust the SADC AAP dialogue on youth empowerment will come up with concrete and vi viable interventions that will help us address the problems facing our, youth, our young people. I wish you the best of success in our deliberations for the next two days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. You are right. Uh, why I said Tobana just a few minutes ago, um, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Minister. You did speak to the power of partnership and the power of collaboration. Um, there is an African proverb that says, if you want to go far alone, but if you want to go far, uh, go together. And I believe that we are going uh, quite a distance um, in terms of our journey in empowering the youth through entrepreneurship, uh, development, and innovation as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, before I do uh, introduce the, the next speaker, we will share on our uh, keynote, and I just take this opportunity to recognize the Director of Human Capital Development at the African Development uh, Bank, Dr. Martha Piri, um, in your presence uh, as we did opportunity do, to do so, as well as uh, let me recognize uh, representatives from Lenovo uh, uh, SADC um, region. Um, Mr. Ruben and your team, you're quite uh, welcome to join us uh, this morning. So all the young people, we do have Lenovo uh, SADC uh, presence, uh, present here, as well as uh, Tassas, uh, Ramola PC, you are um, welcome um, this morning. So um, you Innovation has been mentioned quite a bit, and I, and I uh, through the, the permission of, of the Honorable Minister, how many of us uh, believe that I can give everyone a massage in 10 seconds this morning, in this room, right now? Just by raising, if you believe I can do that, raise your hand. If, if you don't, uh, just keep uh, your hand down. Okay, there's about two or three people. Uh, Mr. Pablo here as well, Your Excellency, you are, you are, you, you are an innovator. So, uh, uh, Honorable Minister, through your indulgence, uh, may I kindly, kindly request uh, for us to uh, rise to our feet as we do that uh, very briefly. Okay, um, if you turn to your left, uh, that's my right. Okay, uh, if you turn to your, your, your left, my right, if we reach out our hands, just don't touch the uh, person next to you because of COVID, and just give them a virtual massage. <laughs> and if we turn the other direction as well, uh, give them a virtual massage. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. I will be sending all of you a bill um, when we exit this room uh, for our tea break. Thank you very much. It is really essentially about uh, solving the problems we face creatively. <laughs> On that note, I'd like to uh, welcome um, Professor Lajitri Maliti to uh, briefly give us an overview of the program of the next two days in terms of the key items we will be discussing, as well as introduce our next uh, speaker, being the keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Martha. Uh, Professor Lajitri, you're welcome. Thank you. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not going to say master of ceremony. That is going to be wrong. <laughs> it's definitely director of ceremony. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the protocol has been observed. It is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's okay. You're okay. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. It is a great pleasure to, to be here um, representing Michigan State University, uh, where I am based and also to indicate uh, MSU's dedication and commitment to youth development in the African continent. Uh, the reason why I'm here and, and the reason AAP is here is because uh, MSU has been working together with partner universities in the region, you know, to steer the conversation about youth development, youth empowerment, youth employment. Uh, we've had a number of projects around the country, but also to mention that we cannot take for granted support that our continent is receiving from a number of governments, the EU in particular, who are behind us uh, in, in supporting this particular program. So this is very important. Uh, we have had other uh, governments, uh, including the United States, I think we have today uh, the director, the mission director for USAID, which is uh, quite, quite pleasing to know that. We also have to indicate that uh, Africa's development is only going to happen in the day and the moment Africans stand up and take advantage of the support that that, 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 that. So the way of moving forward, uh, what I would like to say is that today's dialogue is about turning big challenges into great opportunities. Uh, we move uh, from policy dialogues to actual action plans. This is the conversation, all right? The speakers that have come before me have indicated that there are quite a number of challenges. They've outlined those challenges. Our job is not to repeat them, but they need to be emphasized. Youth unemployment, youth disaffection, the challenges with engendering meaningful youth engagement in national, regional development, and especially getting the youth voice. And then also, one of the biggest challenge is that how do we leverage the youth development instead of looking at it as a burden? I mean, some people have called it uh, the bomb. I, 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 dis I disagree with that because we need to be very positive and out outward looking in our approach to youth development. So it has been outlined, the challenges have been outlined, but the question now is how do we turn these challenges into opportunities? Because the challenges become opportunities. It's as, as simple as that, all right? The objectives of these dialogues are as follows, of this dialogue are as follows. So share the best practices uh, and models of employment and entrepreneurship development throughout the region and elsewhere, which is where we're going to have an opportunity for those who have been doing work uh, in, in Botswana and region in particular, and some of us who have been working in West Africa, particularly Ghana and Tanzania, East Africa, uh, how we can share this. You know, we are in East Africa, Kenya as well, uh, major, a major project going on now that is being, you know, just has taken off. Um, there are other projects in Malawi as well and so on and so forth. The second thing is to discuss mechanisms through which stakeholders can work together on a multi-stakeholder regional initiative to promote youth employment. The key here is how to get youth employment, formal employment. We are able to answer these questions. I think we are, will be home and dry. The other important thing that we would like to, uh, this dialogue to achieve is to identify knowledge gaps in youth empowerment and entrepreneurship space or the space. Uh, the, thing, the thing is, we are saying higher education has a, an important call here to make the difference, uh, particularly in providing evidence-based evidence programming. That's what we are looking for. We also have to think about how, how to coordinate an approach to, uh, that will actually lead to generation of ideas, dissemination of uh, uh, knowledge and ideas about how to do this. A very structured, sustainable. So those are four key objectives that this dialogue hopes uh, to, to address or to, to, to work on and the key points that we'd like to, to see. Role of institutions of higher learning, and here 
So when you talk about institution of higher learning, we're not only talking about the big universities. We're talking about how the universities, of, uh, like the University of Botswana, University of Dar es Salaam, um, Luana, and others, can engage smaller institutions that are considered TVETs, vocational training institutions. Instead of looking at them as, you know, who are these? The idea is we know where the employment is likely to come from, you know, in large scale, out of the four-year college and, and issues like that. So the role of higher education is very important. That should be the conversation today and tomorrow. Need for capacity development, strong partnership between higher education and the private sector, the government and, and, and local government in particular, so that, you know, it's not only the central government doing things, right? Also, what we'd like to see in this dialogue is to provide up-to-date relevant curricula, ideas about up-to-date relevant, how do we develop that, right? The national qualification format comes in, right, for the each country, and also an integrated regional quali qualification format. That's a huge op opportunity right there, all right? Uh, knowledge production with the researchers in working with communities, with the youth, to generate knowledge, okay? Uh, last time, about 2020 or 2019, we were here, and we talked about a revolving door institutions working with, with, with others and where you have talent uh, sharing and the like, you know, within universities, outside of the university, right? Communities of practice, how do we build these? Um, I think uh, Professor Mukandawari talked about um, centers of excellence, think tanks, those are just some mechanisms, right? Other key points, consolidated, consolidated a fragmented approach to youth empowerment, youth development and particularly in the entrepreneurship ecosystem, right? The ecosystem actually needs to be really integrated because there are so many silos operating, different programs being done by different people. And I think we're looking forward to the presentation by uh, uh, Dr. Piri. I think it's really going to be exciting. All right. And then mainstreaming youth voice. So expected outcomes, proposed concrete interventions for youth employment and empowerment, to engagement of youth, in a youth-focused coalition of stakeholders, including councils, ministries, education, uh, youth labor, health, agriculture, you name it. A regional youth platform, and also local platforms, not only nationally, but also within the districts, if you're thinking of Botswana. How do we integrate this and go into this? Because if we speak to ourselves and sit here and say, oh no, we want to do this, we'll do it every year, every year, every year, endlessly. But I'm, I'm very happy for this dialogue, all right? And then highlight key research within the, uh, the youth ecosystem, all right? With those uh, key uh, points about what we would like to achieve, I think I have provided a background of what the platform is about. I mean, I mean sorry, the, not the platform, the dialogue is about and what we would like to achieve. Uh, at this juncture, what I would like to do is introduce our keynote, and then she was going to give us a, a presentation. Dr. Martha Piri, I hope you are ready. Um, Martha Piri is an economist and development practi practitioner with about 25 years of experience in development planning and, and financing. She is currently working as director of human capital, youth skills and development at African Deve uh, National uh, Development Bank. Sorry. She also oversees health and social uh, protection programs at the bank. She is uh, credited uh, having with leading uh, co-leading delivery of bank's COVID-19 crisis response, which is really uh, particularly looking at uh, the response operations with a grant estimated for about 4.1 billion uh, US, US dollars. This was designed to support African countries save lives and jobs and protect vulnerable uh, people during the pandemic. She has also led the design uh, strategy of quality health infrastructure in Africa, uh, between, uh, which is actually now t uh, looking at 20, 2022 to 2030, which is a historic first for the bank, um, particularly looking at skills for employability and productivity in Africa. This is really commendable to support implementation for jobs in Africa uh, ac across. Previous, previously, uh, Dr. Piri worked for the African Development Bank country, as country manager in Rwanda and as country economist for Malawi, Mauritius, and Libya. She has worked as country manager and led teams conducting country dialogues, designing and supervising implementation of both sovereign and non-sovereign funded operations and uh, providing technical knowledge, advisory services to, uh, for reforms. As, a, as an, a country's economist, um, she has uh, uh, leveraged opportunities to drive job-creating growth in different countries, particularly looking at different income groups uh, and, and aligning those with national development priorities. Prior to joining the bank, uh, Dr. Piri worked as an economist in Malawi, as, as I've said, in the Ministry of Finance and Planning, and she's uh, also a, a Commonwealth Scholar, holds a PhD in economics from the University of Liverpool and a Master of Science in Agricultural Economics from the University of Malawi. 
Dr. Piri, we welcome you. Please come over. We want to listen to you and listen to your wisdom. Thank you very much. Honorable and Assistant Minister for Education, for Tertiary Education, Research, Science, and Technology, the representative of the Executive Secretary of SADC, Madam Director, my sister, representative of the EU delegation here with us today, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana, Professor David Norris, the Alliance Partnership. And chairperson of the dialogue, Professor Richard Kandawiri, youth representatives here with us in this room, but also connected virtually, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I'm very delighted to join you today and speak on behalf of the African Development Bank during this very important and timely dialogue on youth empowerment. Let me take this opportunity, Honorable Minister, if you allow, <laughs> to commend the SADC Secretary, the Alliance for African Partnership, and the University of Botswana, and the government of Botswana for hosting this dialogue. I was invited to speak on the topic, Youth Landscape in Africa, and opportunities for poor, poor youth, social and economic empowerment. Madam uh, Director of Program, if you allow me, I have tweaked that a little. And you will see that it speaks to what the Honorable Minister said, what the uh, Madam Director said, and what also Professor said about the we are dealing with today. It's much more than just talk. And it's much more than just empowerment. So the title of my remarks will center around the topic, scaling up investment in Africa's youth for a speedy and sustainable socioeconomic transformation up investment in Africa's youth for a speedy and sustainable socioeconomic transformation. This is because at the African Development Bank, we believe youth empowerment is an investment priority. And it stands at the very center of Africa's socioeconomic transformation. And it requires urgent attention. We believe investing young women and young men is not just a social agenda. It is an economic imperative. Youth unemployment is Africa's most development challenges of our time. And I know that my brother who introduced me talked to us about, you know, keeping away from saying it's a time bomb. And from where he is sitting, it's a negative connotation. From where we are sitting, we acknowledge that it has a negative connotation. But what it does, it compels us to move with speed. Imagine when you are watching a movie and somebody is stuck in a house with something ticking to explode any time. Imagine the pace at which you want to we go around, you know, trying to find a solution and get out of that house so that the impact does not find you. That's exactly where we are going today. And that is why we need to take it as a time bomb in a positive way, not in a negative way. 
And Africa has no choice but to do this. Because for us to move the needle, bearing in mind the challenges that we face, it will require scaling up investment efforts, moving with speed, and taking a sustainable approach that continue to involve the youth themselves. The numbers are compelling. And the Honorable Minister and previous speakers have already alluded to this. As we speak, just to reiterate, over 70% of Africans are under the age of 35. By 2063, the continent's working age population is expected to more than triple to almost 2 billion. At that time, Africa will be concluding implementing the African Union Agenda 2063. The continent will be home to 1 billion young people of working age. 1 billion young people of working age. The SADC shows similar patterns and trends. So with this emerging demographic opportunity, Africa promises to be the next growth frontier. However, we may not realize that because we have a huge challenge on our hands. Africa's growth performance over the two decades and a half prior to the COVID-19 pandemic did not translate into equally high growth in productive jobs. Studies show that three, three out of four people entering the job market every year end up either unemployed or underemployed in the informal sector. And most of these are young people, young women and men. In sub-Saharan Africa, where we sit, including in Sadiq, that ratio worsens even more. Four out of five end up either unemployed or in informal sector. In fact, up to 95% of Africa's youth find themselves in the informal sector, 95% clinging to ill-paying jobs in micro, small, and medium enterprises. The youth are equally represented among the unemployed. Data from Sadiq, uh, the minister spoke to this, highlights that within the Sadiq you have a range of unemployment among the youth from 7.5% uh, to as high as 65% of our young people in Sadiq are unemployed. Now, as a result of joblessness and economic shocks, poverty remains extremely high. 39 million people descended into extreme poverty in 2021 following the COVID-induced recession in Africa, bringing the overall total number of people living in extreme poverty on our continent, in our countries, to 490 million people. This is unacceptable. That is why we believe this requires urgent attention in terms of scaling up investment in our youth, those that are in learning institutions, and those that are joining the labor market, whether they dropped out or they finished school. So how does Africa catalyze economic growth and create, that creates jobs for the youth and promotes social economic transformation? Coming from where we are, we have been looking at where we are and looking at the potential that this continent has, what is it that we can do to create job-creating growth? Where we sit at the African Development Bank, and based on proven studies, we see five strategic priorities that hold the promise for job-creating growth and economic transformation. First, we need to scale up access to power, to electricity on the continent. 
because that is what drives our economies. Two thirds of the world's people living without electricity are here in Africa and mostly here in sub saharan Africa. While the average attack rate is 45%, the range is from 7% in South Sudan to near, of course, to access up north in North Africa. But a number of low-income countries have rates that are below 20%. This is unacceptable. The bank, under the New Deal for Energy in Africa, is supporting African countries scale up investments in power to achieve reliable and affordable access to clean energy for education, training facilities, health centers, and industries, our industries on the continent, so as to boost domestic economic activities and create jobs. Second, we need to enhance agricultural productivity and promote agriculture as a business on the continent. Over 60% of Africans are employed in the agriculture sector. So can you imagine if we can invest, scale up investment in this sector, employing the biggest share of our young people? So we need to enhance productivity so that we can improve returns uh, in, in, the, in the investment in our, in our young people. Because without which, poor agricultural productivity perpetuates food, food insecurity, underemployment, and poverty. At the African Development Bank, we are, we are targeting the youth by making agriculture cool so that it speaks their language and it involves them. The bank's technology for African agriculture transformation, which we call TART, promotes high impact technologies to boost output while the spatial agricultural processes on the continent in value added agriculture to create wealth and, gen and generate gainful employment in rural areas. Third, Africa. In Africa, build as a people, as a continent, but to build our resilience to, to external shock, shocks, save lives and livelihoods as well. Africa, by the way, is at the bottom of the global value chain, with its share of manufacturing only at 2%. 2% is the share of manufacturing on the continent. African economies, in fact, still rely too heavily on exports of primary products. Only about 20% of exports are manufactured goods, compared to 62% of imports. What does that mean? In fact, it means that we're exporting jobs because what we export, you know, receiving countries, value to that. And maybe let me just you know, uh, uh, navigate there very carefully, that demonstrate uh, the, the low investment in market is on vaccines. Can you imagine? We are sitting here. We are sitting here. This is supposed to be one of the biggest, you know, um, global pandemics, global health scares that the world has seen in generations. And yet, we are lucky, of course, that we didn't see the kind of tragedies, the kind of tragedies that we saw in our friend, friend countries, in developed countries. We didn't see that much. Of course, our people died, but not at the scale that we saw in Europe. But can you imagine if that were the case, that we were dying at that scale, and yet, and yet, we are only manufacturing 1% of vaccines, and we rely on others to give us vaccines. And we didn't get the vaccines that we needed, you know, at the pace that we needed them, because it was a life, it was a matter of life and death, you can understand. I mean, if your house is burning, there's no way you can leave your house in order to, you know, extinguish fire in, the, in, your, in your neighbor's house. So no wonder we couldn't get the support that we needed because it was a life 
a matter of life and death. But it was a huge wake-up call for us to invest in our capacity to manufacture not just pharmaceuticals, not just vaccines, but to manufacture everything on the continent. Huge wake-up call. Now, that is why the bank is supporting the industrialization strategy. It has a pharmaceutical action plan that promotes the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals and vaccines. And honorable minister, let me congratulate you. I uh, just received the news that Botswana has actually established a manufacturing, uh, a, a vaccine manufacturing plant, pharmaceutical manufacturing plant. Yes, the way. We are very proud of you. We are very proud of other countries making similar investments in this area. By, by, by investing in manufacturing of vaccines, Botswana is creating jobs here in Botswana for its youth. But it's also supplying the needed vaccines for the region beyond Botswana. Because we know Botswana is just 2 million and, you know, so it's us really outside of Botswana who will also benefit from that. So commendations uh, on that. The bank is also supporting uh, special crops agro-processing zones, just to make sure that we add value to the crops that we produce, so that we produce, and many other agricultural uh, products. Fourth, we need to invest in integrating Africa to consolidate the small fragmented African markets in bigger and more attractive continental markets to boost trade and create jobs. The African market is highly fragmented, 54 small economies. And yet Africa, African trade accounts for just 17% of all trade, the lowest of all global regions. It is the only continent in the world which trades less with itself and is less connected by both land and air. This has to be reversed. Because a bigger, more attractive market is the one that will facilitate job creation, improve trade on the continent. That is why we are encouraged by our leadership on the continent and the many governments that have signed up to the Africa Free Trade Continental uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement because it promises to boost manufacturing jobs, improve trade, as well as increase uh, economic revenues for the for the governments. Of course, we, we we are not naive to say that it will just work like that. We have to work at making it work. And the bank is very pleased to support the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement Secretariat to roll out uh, the, the program. It's also very pleased to support SADC, uh, Madam Director, in making sure that you, know, you facilitate integration, but as well as economic, uh, cross-border economic activities in the SADC region. The bank supports African countries in building regional power transport ICT and transboundary water infrastructure, reduce barriers to trade, and supporting secretariat at continental level and regional economic communities. Lastly, the last strategic focus area, we need to invest on improving the quality of life of our people on the continent. A healthy and skilled work workforce is key to improving Africa's productivity and driving innovation for job creating growth. Allow me to spend a little bit more time on this because it's the center of the discussion we are having today. Madam Kristalina of the IMF on her recent visit to Senegal said, no country on the continent has developed and transformed without investing in the health and education of its The 19 uh, pandemic has just made those it's even more true for the time that we are living in. While the lockdowns were in place, most of our children, unfortunately, including those in the universities, 
could not continue learning. Why? Because of weak learning culture, but also lack of digital skills. Today, less than 15%, of course, of our people are able to do that. Now, unfortunately, we see that African countries co continue to underinvest in science, technology, engineering, education, as well as research and development. Despite the African Union's target of 1% of GDP research expenditure, only 0.4% of GDP is invested in research in Africa, compared to 1.7% globally. STEM graduates represent just 33% of higher education graduates in Africa, compared to 37% in other developing countries like, like ours. Access to technical and vocational education and training, which is key to address unemployment employment in informal sector, is only at 9% on the continent. Unacceptable. As a result, Africa produces only 2% of knowledge and less than 1% of world patents, showing how backward we are in terms of innovation. And we need to acknowledge this if we are to move forward. So besides uh, access barriers, skills mean a, a point that uh, the, the Honorable Minister and uh, you know, um, speakers spoke to remains a critical driver, critical driver of under unemployment due to a weak linkage between education system and labor markets needs. For example, for the 6% of Africa's working youth perceive their skills as mismatched to their jobs. Of course, there is also rapid obsolescence of skills in the labor force because of the fourth industrial evolution and climate change as well as uh, digital transformation. Climate change, we cannot start talking about sustainability, creating sustainable jobs without talking about climate change, which is also driving the need for new skills to prepare our young people for emerging green and climate resilient jobs. Africa is facing the more acute impacts of climate change than any other region on the globe. 70% of top 10 most climate vulnerable countries are in Africa. The extreme weather events that we have seen, such as flooding and droughts, have become more frequent and intense. In fact, we believe that growth slow down remarkably if we do not tackle climate change and if we do not skill our youth to be ready uh, with climate change resilient jobs and green jobs as well. So let me quickly share what the bank is specifically doing to support and create more jobs for young women and men. In practical terms, we are taking a three-way approach under the Jobs for Youth in Africa strategy, integration. We are taking a youth lens in undertaking all bank operations. And I think this is a model that we see in government development plans as well, and that we want to encourage. When we design each project, each initiative, we ask ourselves, how can we maximize the creation of decent jobs for youth in this particular uh, project or initiative. Along with other partners, and of course EU are our key partners, we have developed the joint impact to help us, how, to, to help us how, measure how many direct and indirect jobs we are creating through our investment for operation. And by the way, the bank provides 10 billion US dollars every year in support to member countries. So can you imagine if we ask ourselves how each one of that dollar contributes to youth employment? It will make a huge difference. We found that this, of course, has an impact because it is done after the project has been implemented. We are now working together with the ILO to design a jobs marker so that we are screening project designs for their potential impact on youth employment, even before they are, they are approved by the government 
and by the, by the bank's board. Under the investment pillar of the strategy, we are supporting regional member countries to develop skills for employability by focusing on higher education STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math mathematics, the issue of AI, robotics, and machine learning, but also by supporting digital skills and this is under the Skills for Employability and uh, Action Plan. And I just want to focus on one key element there that speaks to, in practical ways, what it is that we're doing uh, to make sure that it's not just about talk, but investment in young people. We have the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Bank Initiative. Under this initiative, we are supporting African countries develop private sector by, invest, by investing at scale in youth-influenced, youth-led, and youth-owned small and medium enterprises so that we can drive innovation and support formalization to create jobs for the youth. Under the initiative, the bank is taking an ecosystem approach and leverages the public-private partnerships delivery model to de-risk and scale up investments in youth-owned enterprises by addressing bottlenecks which is done through policy dialogue, the one we're doing today, by also reg uh, improving the regulatory uh, uh, policy environment, addressing bottlenecks to regulatory policy environment, building the capacity of entrepreneurs, enterprise support organization, and then mobilizing capital at scale. We believe universities will play a key role as centers of excellence for building entrepreneurial skills within this ecosystem approach. In this way, bringing public-private partners, bringing business development service uh, operators, making sure that the, the government comes in to finance first loss and then improve the business environment, and then having a, an investment fund to provide financing at scale to small and medium enterprises. Bringing that system together is the coherent piece that has been missing uh, so far. You can see it brings academia and think tanks with the leadership of the government. It brings private sector. It brings DFIs, ourselves and others. And it brings uh, financing at scale. This is what has been missing. Now, having said that, let me just you a scale of the financing gap. The financing gap is enormous. Just in education alone, 40 billion US dollars in financing is not, is not provided in education. There is a financing gap of 40 billion US dollars. In health, there is a financing gap of 63 billion US dollars. And in small and medium enterprises, where the majority of our youth are employed, there is a financing gap of 330 billion US dollars every year over the continent. That's how, that's how, that's the scale of the, you know, uh, problem we are uh, facing. However, we believe harnessing partnerships is the way to go because no single player can address this challenge. Not even governments, not even DFIs, private sector, and others. We believe it's by harnessing for both financial and finan non financial uh, services so as to address this financing gap. And how do we do that? First of all, we need to strengthen partnerships with the governments, with the governments who have to own and build the investment in youth employment. They have to undertake, the government needs evidence. You cannot just come and tell them you need to undertake reform X, Y, Z. They need to evidence that that reform is going to work and impact on job creation so that we can have homegrown solutions. And this is where we think that the academia and think tanks have a role to play because you are the ones that research. And you know the continent better. You know the areas. Conduct research, 
that provide you know, solutions so that it can form and encourage governments to undertake reforms. But governments also have to increase domestic resocialization because time is of essence by, of course, making sure that enact the necessary legislation to improve tax mobilization by improving efficiency of spending, but also fighting uh, corruption. They also need, of course, us, all of us, to support their financing endeavors. They will meet it through their budgets, but th looking at the gaps they need us to, and looking at the fact that the fiscal balance sheets have really narrowed because of the COVID-19 responses, they need support for public-private partnerships and also direct private sector financing. Now, in terms of the investors themselves, of course, their role is to, uh, you know, increase uh, the pool of experts of qualified STEM, and the bank is ready to partner with you. At the same time, universities should adopt a new approach to curriculum development. I think some of the investors are already doing that. But certainly we encourage them to focus not just teaching students to go and look for jobs. They must create opportunities within their, their curriculum to harness entrepreneurial skills and provide space for incubating, proving concept, and accelerating business ideas so that students will enter the labor market, not job seekers, but job creators for themselves and others. The civil society, much as sometimes, you know, they are operating in a way that is not very conducive. Much as they are operating in a way that is not very conducive, sometimes it is important that we encourage them because they hold governments to account. They play that role. So it's important that we also partner with them. In conclusion, and Madam, Director, you, you, you reminded me I have two minutes. I'm also concluded. In conclusion, we believe that African governments know what it will take to move their economies forward and create jobs for you. I think the patronizing way that sometimes we approach government is not helping. They know what it takes to move the economies forward. What we need to do is just to listen to them and focus on supporting them how to deliver their development priorities, including making sure that we have a youth lens in everything that we do. And I will finalize by quoting what Dr. John Kengerson said. You probably know him. He was Africa CDC director and made, made an enormous contribution to providing access to uh, COVID tests and COVID response and so forth. He's now joined U.S. Uh, Global AIDS Coordinator to show that he believes in Africa, to show that our partners, the EUs, the EU and others, believe in Africa and what Africa can deliver, because I recall he, he spoke to this as well. Dr. John said, we need to capitalize on the capital and experience of the countries, of those in the countries where we work. Coming to the table, with deep respect for their perspective and needs, and taking into account their knowledge and local expertise. So this includes our young people who are joining us today, as well as everybody in the member countries that we work in. So I hope I have catalyzed enough thoughts, enough uh, ideas uh, for us to engage more beyond this on what it is that we can work together on in order to advance the job creation agenda by investing in our young people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Piri.
for that uh, keynote and indeed um, collaboration as you spoke is uh, key. The challenges we are aware of, but more importantly, challenges uh, present themselves as opportunities and the young people of uh, SADC and the continent at large are ready um, to take on those challenges and providing solutions through products and services um, out into our market for social economic impact. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the close of our official opening, I'd like to invite um, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana, Professor Morris, to hand over a token of appreciation to the Honorable, uh, to Honorable Lesasso, uh, Assistant Minister of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology, who has graciously um, taken the time to spend with us this morning. Um, may I kindly have the, 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 the gift? Uh, Honorable Sasso, may I kindly uh, welcome you to the stage as you hand over. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. V. C. Professor uh, Norris. Honorable Assasso, through uh, a young woman uh, by the name of Jade, does share the challenges that young people face, so I'm sure he is uh, quite accustomed to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Prof Professor Norris, if I could, thank you, thank you, Honorable. If I could just uh, kindly ask you to remain on stage, I'd like to invite um, uh, Dr. Piri. Um, as we as well hand over, Professor Norris uh, hands over a token of appreciation for your, for your keynote that is, uh, was uh, quite um, informative, especially with the discussions ahead to receive a token of appreciation. May I please have the... Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's nice, uh, beautiful smiles um, after a couple, a, a rough couple of two years um, where we haven't been able to convene. Um, may I, as well, Professor Norris, um, request. I'm sorry, um, request um, the representative from the Uni European Union, um, Re Pablo, um, who greeted us in the various uh, uh, languages, um, to, to, yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, may I please have the gift? Round of applause. Thank you. Um, may I also take this opportunity to um, welcome um, uh, Madame uh, Similani, um, the representative from uh, SADC, uh, Director of uh, Social and Human Development, uh, as a token of appreciation and to remember us uh, as, as well um, within the office. As we did hear that, um, the various speakers that collaborate is key to the success of the objectives of this partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Norris. Uh, Professor Mkandawira, we, we have not forgotten you. We are together. Um, so I just needed to, to, to make that note. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. As we've come to the end of our program, um, like I said, uh, Mr. Milani from SELEC did mention a very 
um, important um, area that I believe that will be taken on as a challenge and incorporated in each and every single item that we, di we, that we do discuss, which is the issue of uh, gender and gender representation. And on that note, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to um, recognize the presence of um, former Minister of Tr Investment, uh, Trade and Industry, or Trade and Industry, Honorable Bukhulik Kenuendo, who um, has been quite a force to reckon with within our nation. We continue to celebrate her not only as a leader first, um, as a female, and as a young person. So, uh, make a window. Um, may you kindly uh, rise. Okay, uh, maybe she may, must have stepped out of the room. Um, but uh, it, indeed, we just we do recognize her, especially um, in consideration of the uh, of, of the gathering here this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been an inspiring opening session, um, and I believe that um, the although the assistant minister will be leaving us, um, he will take on um, the various uh, presentations that were that were discussed this morning. And like I said, uh, uh, honourable uh, minister, that we believe that we will have such dogs um, in Tobela, in Shoshong. Um, and other parts um, of uh, the country where young people may not have the opportunity um, to be here, but uh, culminating um, us as, as, a, as a region. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for yourselves. A round of applause. We have come to the end of the official opening. However, um, there will be uh, other great deliberations um, from here. There is tea that will be served um, in the courtyard, and there will be um, team members to show you um, the way. And if uh, th there is uh, any um, challenge, please do not let us know. Thank you so much. Um, and may we um, just uh, rise and appreciate the Honorable Minister as he uh, leaves us um, this morning. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please know that uh, our tea break is from is, is, is 10 minutes, so kindly just ensure that we quickly um, get our tea uh, and uh, come back to convene in this room for um, the uh, panel discussion um, specific.
Fine, how are you? This was when we missed that time. Oh, yeah. 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 So why are you doing that? I'm in the circle. In the circle.
Okay. So uh, let, uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Moata is here. Please uh, oh, let me look at my program. Yeah, so we're going to have uh, Tabo Tileshina. Miss Chabiri. Benny Sakala. That's a Benny Sakala. So <laughs> we should have the speakers come up. Okay, uh, can we have the speakers please come up, the discussants? Re uh, Selechina, how are you saying? Long time. Yeah, okay, you're here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I will change it to put your name. Oh, okay. So that's good. Uh, let me correct that so that I can introduce you properly. So, um, can you, you, you have to, oh, yeah, you're going to sit here.
Uh, do you have uh, Ms. Habir in Jabi, uh, Jabir, Jabril? Ms. Haja Jabir? Yes, take this one because when we update it, that we can get the certificate. Are you okay here? Yeah, thank you. So take it, leave it like that next time. So that we Okay, um, good morning. We are running behind schedule, of course, as it is ex to be expected with the tea and uh, starting late earlier. Um, so what we're going to do is we will have a, uh, this session to, you know, have our discussions, share some perspectives from where they are seated the kind with the roles that they have been uh, involved in uh, on related to the youth dialogue. And so uh, in the process of doing that, I uh, actually start off by int asking them, introducing them and asking them to say a little bit. And then that will be followed by questions and comments from, from the audience so that uh, we, we, we can inter interact with them and uh, you know, appreciate uh, how they can actually share perspectives on some of these issues. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Tabo Shilashina. Uh, Mr. Tabo Shilashina is head of a uh, group uh, Venture, new com venture capital and commercial at Let's Zero. Right, and then we have uh, Mr. Tato Jensen, uh, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at um, Chief Strategy Officer at uh, CIDA. Then we have Dr. Benis Sagawa, who is the Chief Director responsible for Youth Affairs in and, and the Representative Office of South Africa. She represented uh, uh, the, the, the Office of uh, the, the Youth Affairs Office in, in the Republic of South Africa, in South Africa, okay? So, Dr. Benice Chahala, thank you. All right, so um, I need the, uh, the, the, the mic, we, we need to use this. So we're gonna start this way and then you share your thoughts about what you've been doing in uh, like, like uh, three, four minutes and then we'll just uh, move, move around doing that. So we, let's let's start uh, this side with a uh, red application. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, MC, as the facilitator. 
And a very good morning to you again. Uh, as introduced, my name is uh, Tato Jensen. I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer at the Citizen Entrepreneurial Development Agency. Uh, just as a background, the agency was founded to try and promote or facilitate deepened citizen economic participation uh, in the economy. So when we speak to issues of citizen inclusion, when we speak to issues of youth empowerment or substantially providing the space for the youth to participate, that is more or less uh, our mandate. Uh, in terms of where we are, we are trying our level best as an agency to promote the participation of the youth uh, in our funding. Uh, we recently reviewed uh, our guidelines, which guidelines created increased, we would say, access to, to funding. Uh, we reduced the interest rates. We have more or less reduced the need for security and collateral. Uh, we have also included more diverse, I would say, youth-friendly uh, sectors that we believe that more often than not, the youth are likely to have an interest in or gravitate towards. This would be your creative uh, sector or the creative industry, uh, technology and innovation, in the broadest definition of technology and innovation. Uh, we've also, of course, included your mining. Uh, agriculture is a key priority sector that we we're looking at funding, uh, as well as tourism. Over and above are the sectors that we have traditionally been funding. All this is meant, uh, in a way, uh, to widen access to and uh, in terms of the performance to date, over the past three years, we've been able to fund uh, 4,327 youth, 4,327 youth enterprises to the tune of just a little over 166 million. The question would be, is this good enough? Uh, well, from where I sit, I don't think so, but a lot more can be done. We still face challenges, and I think as my period did highlight, are challenges of ensuring that there is indeed deepened access to funding for the youth. The challenges of securitization and collateralization, as well as access to land, or access, should I say, to assets, a key challenge in ensuring that indeed there's increased youth participation in terms of our funding. How do we get around this? Do we have the right policies, I think, regionally, nationally, to really support and understand the realities of the youth? Do we really understand where they are in terms of asset formation? And then how do we then de-risk their ability uh, to ensure that they access funding? This is a dialogue that must be broadened. This is a dialogue that must be deepened. And I firmly believe until we have really looked at how we ensure that the youth are, for example, able to access land or service land, they are ab able to look at their situation for what it is and not what it should be. They don't have assets or they don't have ready access to assets. What sort of financing products and instruments can we advance to ensure that you know, we, we deepen their, 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 their involvement in the economy or in economies Africa-wide? One of the challenges that we have and what we need to realize, my Piri mentioned, Dr. Piri mentioned the need for industrialization as a key priority. Will our economies grow enough to really be able to absorb the youth dividend? As she highlighted, it is not reducing, it is growing but will our economies be able to absorb that? We need to change mindsets radically. We need to look at the youth being able to create employment, being self-employed, rather than looking uh, for work. And this has to do, at look, this, this will require the entire ecosystem uh, to come together from your research and development institutions to the banking industry, uh, to policies around access to land, for example, in our respective countries, and how we ensure that we facilitate deep in the access uh, to those assets to enable the youth to be fundable. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I am Panini Tabosolachana from Nitsoho. Um, I think so you would know we are a pan-African uh, financial services and we focus on uh, small, uh, micro and small enterprises in terms of uh, business entities and then um, middle um, income earners um, and the like. Um, from our perspective, financial inclusion is one of our key pillars. Um, there's a lot of innovation or products that we look to. Um, in Namibia recently, we launched an affordable housing uh, program, and it's something we are looking to leverage um, in some of the other markets that we work in. 
um, in terms of products, we have looked for products that can help um, youth enterprises and um, the smaller enterprises that perhaps be overlooked by the bank or unable to access um, services from uh, uh, traditional banks. I think one of the differences when I'm listening to my colleagues from CEDA is, uh, and we sh I think probably they are key in, and other organizations such as CEDA um, in the SADC region is that they would, uh, they are able to go into new venture creation, whereas for us we'd more be, uh, be dealing with um, existing entities, but looking at how can we help them grow. So um, a young person gets a tender, um, when delivering such a tender, whether it's with government or with a larger organization, um, there is a need for capital to be able to deliver on grow their, their business um, and be able to secure more businesses. So we do offer um, serv uh, products um, that enable them to access uh, accessing capital uh, based on the fact that they are going to get paid um, for the contract that they're in. Um, outside of financing, we've also been trying to work a lot more to understanding uh, what uh, the youth of Africa want. Um, you know, we, are p we have positioned ourselves as a digital financial services uh, company. We are looking uh, a lot more towards products that are focused on the youth. We recently had a uh, Twitter space with one of Botswana's foremost um, Twitter space hosts, uh, and we had uh, youth entrepreneurs from uh, Botswana, from Mozambique, uh, from uh, uh, Nigeria, and uh, from Rwanda that were speaking um, at that time. Those are all markets where Lesotho um, is, is present. And that is just to try and uh, you know, build that conversation, understand, connect, create that connectivity within Africa so that we can, you know, you know, we're able to, to understand the challenges um, that youth entrepreneurs are having, uh, understand, get learnings as well of what uh, people in other markets uh, are doing. And it's something that we are looking to continuously uh, leverage. So uh, that was on Twitter. We've also recently had an event uh, on the Women's Day that was hosted on uh, LinkedIn. Um, and so, you know, technology is something um, that is, is quite uh, by the youth and we're looking to make sure that we are playing in that space and understanding how we can be a force um, for the youth. Uh, one of the things that we've had, which recently closed, and this was in the market, um, and we will be extending this to other regions that we operate in, uh, was a digital entrepreneurship, uh, uh, mentorship rather, a digital entrepreneurship and mentorship program. Um, this will see the people, so we open this for 10 uh, uh, people who've got uh, businesses um, that they can come uh, into Litsafo and get, uh, get mentorship from a lot of the fintech organizations that we're working with to build that scale. Uh, during that time, those participants will be drawing an allowance uh, from Litsoho, and ultimately, at the end of it, we'll be looking to a, um, an uh, I don't know if I should say equity, but there's 500,000 bula that's available uh, to, entity to those, uh, those uh, participants um, towards the end of the program. Uh, so that was launched in Botswana um, and it closed at the end of uh, March. We are still selecting, we had a lot of uh, 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 applications for that and we are selecting those 10 people. Uh, and then as I said, we will go into other markets and I think that is, that is something that is in terms of uh, creating um, capacity, creating those skills, helping the youth pick up from successful fintechs. Uh, I think right now, you look in the financial services, banks are being disrupted by fintechs, and there's a whole lot of how do we get uh, you know, entities within uh, the SADC region uh, playing more. I think if you look at uh, the powerhouses for fintech in Africa is Nigeria, it's Kenya, um, it's South Africa, um, and there's a need for how we can scale up uh, entities in other regions that we operate in, especially if you look, we've got a good presence in SADC with that skill, with that capital and, and capacitization. Um, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And we then have uh, Professor Fleming Kamala, who is going to give us her report on the Balancing Act and the Balancing Act. 
Thank you. Uh, let me start off by explaining my role. Um, I'm responsible for youth development po uh, policy development. And, um, you know, like the rest of the continent, South Africa also developed policy for young people. We have um, our national youth policy, which has recently been approved. But, and we also have um, MNE framework to track implementation of the policy. We, have, we are now in the process of having an integrated youth development strategy to give effect to the policy implementation being approved. But then, um, you know, the concern is that we have uh, very good, nice policies, but then, you know, the policies don't always, uh, actually most of the time, they don't necessarily translate into implementation. And, uh, you know, Dr. Piri in her presentation alluded to the fact that um, youth is a challenge, um, you know, of our time. And uh, what is even concerning is the fact that uh, when you talk about the issue of youth unemployment, it has got, uh, you know, knock off, knock on, uh, you know, knock on effect, you know, because um, it can actually result in many other challenges for the youth. For an example, an unemployed youth can, um, an unemployed youth can end up uh, depends to intoxicating substances, and they can in turn, uh, you know, uh, after abusing the substances, then it can lead to mental health challenges. They can end up, uh, you know, being the perpetrator of um, gender-based violence and femicide. So, you know, it has got the ripple effect, which is actually concerning. And um, we need to actually be very urgent in ensuring that we invest in our youth. And she also alluded to a number of areas where we need to invest, um, you know, in, in our youth. For an example, um, one priority area uh, which has been mentioned is the issue of um, enhancing agriculture and agro-processing. But then if you look at that um, alone and, you know, look at the, our curriculum, is that, you know, agriculture is not even offered in, in, in high school. So how do you actually talk about attracting young people to agriculture when you have not actually entrenched that during their school years? So that is actually one of the challenges that we need to look at. Then also making agriculture attractive to young people. Area. When you talk agriculture, young people think hard, hard labor, you know, so you n they don't even know the agro-processing part of agriculture. So those are some of the things that we need to actually try and, you know, create a culture where young people actually understand the, the, the value chain in, 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 in agriculture. The other area which, um, you know, we need to look at is the, is the, is the whole issue of um, industrializing Africa. On industrialization, um, Mepiri, when she was presenting, she alluded to the fact that um, we need to increase the share of manufacturing from 2%. I mean, if you only have 2% manufacturing, whereas manufacturing is a high, is an area, is an employment area with high absorption capacity, that is actually a challenge. Uh, it means that we are really shortchanging our youth when it comes to, you know, making them, um, you know, play a critical role in the, within the employment sector. So the, the, the other is um, investment in improving the quality of life for people, making sure that uh, they have, uh, you know, quality life, but then even um, the nature of uh, education which our youth are actually receiving, it needs to be of quality nature so that it can translate into improving the lives of our people. For an example, uh, the low level of STEM gradu graduates is actually a, a challenge that people are not involved in technical vocational education and training is also a challenge. So the issue of, um, you know, um, skills mismatch is also a challenge. And um, this dialogue, because it's one of a, the initiatives which encourages working closely with institutions of higher learning, it means that uh, collaboration where we need to actually come up with a, a human resource development plan. Why do institutions of higher learning continue to train young people in areas that are not uh, you know, there, there are no jobs. You know, that is actually a question because it looks like the, the industries, are do, I mean, the universities are doing, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, further education and training institutions, they are doing something else, but then the industry is actually, you know, requiring 
different um, you know, skills. So we need to make sure that there is a match between production of our graduates as well as uh, you know, wha the, the demand, uh, the I mean the, the, the supply to our industries. And you know, f um, the issue of youth leadership skills, for an example, our children are not even taught that uh, you know, they, they have to be entrepreneurs from a very early age. Um, for South Africa, for an example, the total entrepreneurship uh, activity level is very low compared to that which is happening in other um, you know, countries. And it's a challenge because you look at the enterprises as well as small businesses, they are key when it comes to job creation. So if we are not doing well in that area, and wh whereas we are aware that um, our economy is not actually growing and and absorbing as many young people um, you know, into jobs as possible, then it means that it, it is actually a, cha a, a challenge. So I think um, you know, all this uh, shows that if we are not really investing in young people as a resource, um, it will actually result in the uh, high inequality levels, but then even the extreme um, you know, poverty levels that uh, we are currently uh, experiencing. And then the cycle of intergenerational poverty will not be broken for as long as there is uh, no investment uh, in, in, in our youth. And then finally, let me just say that young people have actually proved that uh, they are an instrument of change society if provided with an opportunity if they are well supported and uh, we have seen in many areas where they have been very instrumental in uh, liberating their own countries young people have been very instrumental in ensuring that they bring about change and sometimes you know the, 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 the their involvement um, one of the presenters ours is to make sure that we channel their energies so that they actually contribute positively to their society. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, what we have uh, quite uh, had uh, discussion points about some of the issues uh, and, and the activities related to the keynote, what, uh, for instance, Sida is doing, uh, what Le Chiro is doing, and also the perspective coming from South Africa on, you know, what the policy issues and what have you. So without uh, wasting much time, what I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, I may some questions like the, the audience to step, step in here and if there are questions that you have directly related to what you would like the discussions to highlight, we, we, start, we start there so that you know, uh, we don't dominate it. Good morning, everyone. Um, my, my question is, is based on 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 on, on, on six years that uh, colleagues from Sida that uh, mentioned. Um, the different models. If you're looking at the current uh, 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 economic uh, development uh, strategy of creating small medium enterprises. Uh, for starters, uh, universities have proven to be big. Um, contributing factor in developing this small medium enterprise. But then, um, my question would be: What, what model can 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 we use to ensure that uh, to ensure securitization in social development? Because most of the young people develop uh, very wonderful uh, entities that can be commercialized at a certain point, but then they don't have finance. Um, to reference uh, from this statement, um, last, last week we were, we were at the, uh, the United Nations uh, Young uh, Innovators Forum, and most of the young people were, uh, they were only complaining about uh, funding. But then as the forum went on, it showed that they've got presented very wonderful uh, initiatives that can also be uh, commercialized. So then it comes to a point where now uh, local private sectors cannot be able to fund them because uh, it costs the issue of securitization. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 cannot be able to say, I have this to secure uh, the idea that I have. So what model can, 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 can we do work around to ensure that R&D 
banget gitu di sini pernah kubur mati. Terus tuh kan Um, I think, th thank you for your, your points. Um, I, I think my, my colleague from Sweden might be a bit better suited because, um, as I mentioned, we are not yet in the space of new venture creation. Uh, so you find we usually be dealing with um, existing entities, but I think it is, um, look, it's, 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 a, it's a good problem. I was previously with us. Um, again, you know, you'll find that banks are the, the banks are also not necessarily funding new ventures. So we've got new ventures. We are either speaking to angel investors, venture capital, um, the likes of CEDA, the likes of perhaps NBB. Um, if I speak from a Botswana context, um, and and I think um, my uh, Mr. Jensen mentioned that there is a need to look at a different model. Um, as he's saying, if we are looking to um, I, you know, go and I speak to a funder, and they are looking for ways of um, securing um, that it's 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 probably not going to to fly. Uh, but I think one of the things, and you know, without the benefit of of the, the that you were in last week, I I do speak to uh, those in the venture uh, capital um, industries, and some find is um, we. There's a certain language um, that they are looking for. I think what you find is with the venture capital, they, they won't necessarily want security um, in the traditional way um, that banks are looking for them. They are looking for viability. Um, so when we go um, to speak about, about our businesses and about the opportunity, it's about making sure that we understand this is this is our market. This is how we are going to um, address, um, you know, entering and gaining market share in those markets. Um, and they've got very good ways um, of of um, of assessing. Um, so recently, there was a young man that I was helping introduce to one of the angel uh, the funding networks. Um, and when I looked at it, oh, this is it is a very good plan. When we fought it, we actually came back with quite a number of questions um, that they would look for um, for the. They took some time. They were able to answer um, the questions that were being asked. Um, but it then also speaks to, do we have those forums where we are able to um, you know, approach um, uh, those youth to, these are the things that you need to uh, address. When you go for funding rounds, you hear you've got different funding rounds. So series A funding, series B funding, and so forth, where they will actually take equity stakes um, in your business. And over time, you are diluting the ownership of your business, but you're getting the capital that you need to launch your business to scale up and to expand, say, into um, if you're looking. Though they certainly um, offer uh, different funding models, we are beginning to see a movement away from traditional. So if you look at the Botswana Public Reserve Pension Fund, for example, they recently gave money to private equity. Private equity, again, is more looking at established businesses um, good opportunity to scale up so the hope and the reason i'd mention that is that but entities that are looking our what are other ways to use our capital um, in the market instead of just the traditional way so if you look at a pension fund they did was put their money to bonds in the stock market um, they are now looking at our um, areas of and hopefully um, i think with fora like this and others in the in the in the in the in the economy, you can start also going to these pools of, of money like pension funds and others uh, to say there's also an alternative. What do we do towards new ventures? There is. Well you've already mentioned it, and, and um, that the youth have a lot of ideas. The businesses and capital um, is an issue, but I'll, I'll hand over to Mr. Jensen. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much uh, for that very difficult question. 
uh, we need to shift from traditional funding models to more, I wouldn't say modern, but funding models that understand the situation and context of the different segments that we fund. We can no longer have uh, funding instruments that generalize between me and you, for example. You're younger, you're at a certain level of, of, of growth in terms of your career or your business, and in your access to assets may be highly limited or dependent. So uh, within, within the discussions that we are having, uh, especially from an R&D perspective, we are closely working with uh, BUST in Palate, uh, the International University of Science and Technology. We are working with BITRI uh, to see how the issue of intellectual property and patenting uh, can be used as collateral, particularly for your R&D or innovative or innovation uh, 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 projects or initiatives. They, we also need enabling legislation at national level. Uh, although I cannot speak to it with some fair of precision, I do believe that there is no legislation at the moment. We will confirm. Uh, if I'm wrong, we will correct that. But I firmly believe at the moment we do not have uh, a national inter intellectual property legislation that would enable the ease at which we are able to collateralize ideas uh, so that we look at intellectual as an asset in itself and what we are gravitating towards, especially when we look at the younger generation who are able to come up with ideas and ideas uh, that we, we, we can uh, pursue. We also need to look at our development risk capital. See, as a development finance institution. It's not a commercial, uh, it's not your, 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 your Barclays Bank, for example, or your FNB. And our responsibility there is to de-risk. That means uh, we are mandated to fund startups. So our risk appetite is generally higher compared to other banks, given their costs and their business models. But a lot more can be done by ensuring that your DFIs, your, your CEDAs, your, your NDBs are allowed to take greater risk through the provision of what I'd say government guarantees, which would then verify our lending uh, and look at issues of security and collateral very differently. Because where there are guarantees around, that in itself uh, is a risk management tool that or dilutes uh, the risk posture of that, of that particular project. So we, we need to look at the entire ecosystem and, and say that pe perhaps as a government or government, when it comes to certain segments, we should be able to develop risk capital and how we can ensure that it supports the increased inclusion of the marginalized, should I say, those that are, are, are not participating meaningfully are in the economy. Thank you. responses very brief so that you know we can get to the point very quickly. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Lepp. Um, yeah, I wanted to start by really appreciating um, Dr. Piri's uh, presentation on scaling up um, investment for Africa's youth. I thought that was really brilliant and I love how the panel is tying in on the some of the issues that she raised and particularly some of those strategic uh, priorities. Um, I <laughs> A deep part of me is feeling like um, we are deciding for the youth what their priorities should be. I think it's very critical that we hear from them. I think we are, um, we should be thinking about um, investing in what they are interested in, what they are invested in themselves, where their energies um, seem, seem to be gravitating towards. 
Um, I, I like how I think Baholo and elders are always thinking, oh, these are the areas that the youth should be go gravitating towards. But meanwhile, they're actually showing us where they want their energies to go, where they want their investments to go. And in that light, I'm thinking we are really ignoring a very um, critical area uh, that the youth are about, and that's the cultural and creative industries. I haven't heard anybody this morning that as part of their prior priorities or even you know their thoughts um, in terms of what they are building in terms of um, when you are um, re um, when you are thinking about reinventing funding models i don't know if you are thinking about um, you know something along the lines of what you the cultural and creative industries so my question is you know to the panel is what kind of investments are you making towards that particular sector that the youth are invested in and how um, um, yes um, how are you making sure that your 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 services your 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 products are reaching the cl the youth um, uh, the youth that you are targeting uh, this is about information dissemination thanks um, maybe let me put a way to get the response from it i'm going to ask uh, Dr. Benis Sakala to talk a little bit uh, in relation to the youth voice, just quickly on how do you get the youth voice on, on board, and then we can get to the, uh, the responses to you know the, the other industries. So particularly with the youth voice, we are thinking about you know how do you get people so that they they are part of decision making processes in what impacts them and what they find as a priority. Thank you. Um, I think when 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 uh, the, the the director was actually making a presentation, um, one of the things that she mentioned as a priority for SADC was the issue of um, institutionalizing youth platforms. And um, in doing that, it's actually one way of trying to ensure that the young people's voices, you know, is actually heard. Um, she mentioned the issue of um, establishment and capacity building of the National Youth Councils. And, um, you know, the topic was even taken further to say that uh, maybe we need to ensure that uh, we actually uh, cascade that to district levels. So this model of the National Youth Council is actually working, but uh, the challenge that we are having in member governments is that uh, youth councils are usually used as political tools. So, you know, I think that is actually a, ch a challenge. But the structure itself is meant to be apolitical, is meant to ensure that young people's voices are heard from the local or even the levels. So I think if we can actually enhance the models. Actually, when she was pre uh, presenting, one of the things that um, I had in mind was, was that, uh, you know, the fact that uh, youth councils are actually supported more by governments is a challenge because then they are not becoming independent. So maybe we need to make sure of looking at the funding models for youth councils. But then again, um, empowering young people so that they are not used as pawns within the communities, within their society is actually very, very critical. Young people are meant to be radical. And, you know, as adults, um, you know, um, we must actually guide them. Um, we must not actually, um, you know, deem their voices, but then we must just channel them so that uh, whatever they can actually do it in a very constructive manner. For an example, the issue of creative industry, uh, which has been alluded to. Uh, many young people, when they think about that, they just think about being DJs. They just think about, um, you know, um, you know, singing. They don't know the value chain of the creative industry. And it is our role that, uh, you know, we, we must actually guide them that they are sound engineers. There is, you know, these other careers that can actually come from the in creative industry uh, uh, value chain. So it is our role that, you know, in as much as, uh, you know, our youth are very energetic, we need to make sure that we actually redirect them. But then, um, you know, empowering the, the, the National Youth Councils and making them uh, apolitical is one way of ensuring that uh, young people's voices are actually heard. But then young people also need to make sure that, you know, they participate even in decision-making structures so that they can actually make their needs uh, known. Thanks. 
you know these organizations to be apolitical. You mentioned a very important point, but also to inspire these various youth organizations. Before you go to the next question, I want you to quickly think about, uh, share with us what your feeder is doing, particularly, you know, with some of these other industries that are not mainstream, that could be you know, youth and employment. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe I overlooked mentioning it uh, in my or opening remarks. Uh, but as part of the revised CEDA guidelines, uh, we have significantly increased the number of focus sectors that we are more than willing to explore and fund. And this also includes the creative industry. And when we talk about the creative industry, we, we are talking about it in its one platform. And we allow the creative thinker to lead us so long as that uh, initiative or business is viable, because it all comes down to the numbers at the end of the day, and fundable. But the creative industry and its value chain is what we have introduced. We've also introduced technology and inno innovation as a key for in its widest definition. Uh, manufacturing has always been there, but we have prioritized it now. Uh, we've also included tourism, which we also believe holds a lot of potential in terms of employment creation. We're scaling up our focus there. And within agriculture, uh, in particular horticulture, uh, given uh, our import, uh, should I say import bill at the start, but also the need to develop that value chain and ensure that we become more export-led in the medium to long term. But the creative you can rest assured, we are more than willing to fund. Thank you. I think the point you're raising is that there's need for even deeper conversation for it that could also have a regional focus because some activities might be unique in certain regions of the country uh, and also uh, other regions of the of the region uh, of the region I'm talking about southern Africa so basically uh, I think you're really touching on some important points we want to take one last question and then transition into the next session uh, because we do not have much time and we want to make sure that we go through the this first session or the first morning uh, the before lunch program uh, fully. Uh, was there a hand here? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let's let's have uh, the gentleman there first. Um, okay. Neil, Neil first. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I share the same sentiments with her that sometimes want to think for the youth what they want. And also, mine is not a question, it's a question. And also, I think we, as we are planning for the youth, where we are and where our panelists or discussants are talking about, it's already at the branches or at the leaves, uh, not at where we need to. We are talking about funding, we are talking about everything. The most important aspect that we have left is the education system. Our education system does not teach a young person to go and look for the money that you are talking about. Our education system is coined in a way that it teaches a young person to go and go to school, pass, look for a job. And not only that, their parents have gone through the system. It has been tested with their parents. And they you open your business, you face the problem of government. Because sometimes government can open the money, grow up the tax of the government. And this is a difficult. So if there is a possibility to think how we can integrate, who create a program of entrepreneurship in the SADC region to see how we can give the young people the chance to understand first the culture of entrepreneurship understand the prob the risk of business and to see how to face the problem of climate change. Thank you very much. Yeah. Th thank you very much and I, I really appreciate hearing because I know you are from the Comoros and there are so many experiences that you are likely to learn from you. So what we're going to do is we want to transition into the next session that's going to be chaired by Dr. Tube and uh, there will be more questions during that after that presentation. We want to make sure that after that we will have to go to lunch and then come back into the plenary sessions that are going to be giving us an opportunity to discuss in full what should be happening. So I want at this moment to thank our, our panelists and uh, really appreciate your, your
sharing of the perspective you shared with us. So thank you very much. We will be calling you as we move along. Thank you very much. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, or oh, is it morning? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it's actually afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as introduced, my name is uh, Tsube. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Sports Science here at the University of Botswana, and I'm privileged to facilitate the next session. Um, so I'm pretty aware that we are behind time, so I'll try to move it uh, pretty fast so that we have enough time to have lunch and be back um, uh, for the uh, session. So I will introduce the next two speakers. Uh, 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 they'll come sit up front, and then they will each speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, the speakers, are, I'll start by inviting uh, Dr. Juliana Machuve. She's a lecturer at the University of Dar es Salaam, College of Engineering. Um, she has a PhD in engineering management. She's also the coordinator of innovation at the University of Dar es Salaam. Innovation and um, Entrepreneurship Center, so she coordinates uh, the center. Uh, Juliana coordinates a business and organizer, reviewer of judge in various national competitions on science um, and technology, uh, works in interdisciplinary teams, and she has a passion for empowering people to come up with innovative and entrepreneurial solutions uh, uh, to some of the problems that young people face. So let's give a huge round of applause. Thank you, uh, Dr. Juliana, for the privilege to join us uh, this afternoon. Then I'll introduce uh, the next uh, speaker. Uh, she will, uh, they will present at the same time, uh, Dr. Sarah Rose Jarapoa Gondwe. I hope I pronounced that well. <laughs> Thank you. Round of applause as she comes up to the uh, podium. She's a business economist and faculty member at the University at the, in the Department of Agrobusiness Management at Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Uh, with over 15 years experience in, of training, research, and advisory work for the Agrobusiness Center. So, uh, uh, Sarah, a Michigan State University Innovations, uh, Innovation Scholar uh, Program Fellow. So, we're privileged to have you uh, this afternoon. So, I don't know who's going to speak first. Um, who Okay, uh, Dr. Sarah, the space belongs to you. So you'll speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then Dr. Juliana will come in. Well, maybe as we're waiting for the technology, we should already kick start the discussions that we would want to see ahead. I particularly like the previous discussion because the focus where it was going, it was to do with education, the education system. What is it that we are doing? And our presentation, the focus is going to be on the higher education institutions. What is it that we are doing as higher education institutions? What is our role? 
within an ecosystem so that we can be able to realize what is it that we can offer. And it's not just us. It's not just us because we are in an ecosystem. That's what our presentation is going to be focusing on. So this presentation is contributing to the discussions that we are having to have an understanding of the your ecosystem in Africa and it will focus on a report which was done for a scoping study done in a number of countries that are under the AAP membership. So just a bit of a background about what really happened for us to do this particular study. So the AAP consortium members have agreed to have a focus in terms of their interventions on youth empowerment as a key driver in the sustainable industrialization in Africa. And as we know by now, this is in line with a number of frameworks that are there to focus our interventions in terms of how we are going to channel our development initiatives. So through the internal discussions throughout the members and the other stakeholders, a key gap area arose that yes, we're talking about the ecosystem, but do we understand what the ecosystem is? Do we really understand what is going on? So a study then was initiated for an initial understanding of what this ecosystem is all about. So before we actually go into what we found out, I wanted us to be on the same page in terms of what is this entrepreneurship ecosystem we are all talking about. We've heard this word throughout the discussions in the morning. So what is it about? Where are we in this ecosystem? So a simple issue, a simple discussion of what this entrepreneurship ecosystem is, is that it is a set of interconnected actors. It could be institutions, it could be organizations, processes, networks that are whether formally or informally working together as to be able to connect, mediate, and govern the performance of the local entrepreneurial environment. In this case, for today, our focus is that this entrepreneurial environment we're looking at is focused on the youth, the youth entrepreneurs. What is it that we're doing? So I would want each one of us, as we listen to this presentation, to focus on ourselves, ourselves as individuals, ourselves as actors, ourselves as institutions that have a key role to play within this ecosystem. We are supposed to move together. If one entity is not working out well, then definitely the other entity won't work out well. So in this system, the youth are part and parcel of the system. They are not a standalone. But for them to be able to do what we would want them to do, they need now support from the various entities that are in the system. So yes, we have this system. It means it has got a number of entry points for it to be able to function well. So for our discussion, the entry point is the higher education institution. Why higher education institution? Well, that's why I said I was glad with the previous discussion because that's where we already started talking about education. We all start from somewhere and our higher education system, that is where we are building human capital. That's where we are building the skills, the competences, and that is what is catalyzing the awareness to be created out there. That is what should catalyze the changed attitudes, the changed mindsets for what we want the entrepreneurs to be doing. So apart from that, education is going to be able to know that this works in this context. This works in South Africa, but it can't work in Malawi. This does not work in Uganda, but it works in Senegal. So they have to bring out that knowledge. And that knowledge is the one that is helping actually now realize the outcomes. So it is also a catalytic unit as well, so that we can be able to end up producing the reflective practitioners, reflective entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs with a mindset to really not fear and invest and focus their passion on the issues that we want them to be able to do. So back to our scoping study. So the scoping study, a, a multi-country assessment of the youth entrepreneurship ecosystem, and it was done collaboratively by among a number of researchers from the various 
African um, higher education institutions which are members of the AAP. And the report that came out of there, which I hope all of us will be able to have access to it, is that of the Youth Entrepreneurial Ecosystem for Sustainable Development in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the focus of the, um, the scoping study was to analyze the youth entrepreneurial ecosystem and assess the state of entrepreneurship training in Africa. Our approach, we looked at the various countries as a case, and we spoke to youth entrepreneurs, we spoke to youth entrepreneurial actors. So in the actors, that's where you find all of us are in there. We have the academia, we have financial institutions, the private sector, we have the business development units, we have um, uh, non-government organizations. So everybody else is there. And remember the picture that we had, it is a system, we are moving together and each one of us has a role. So this was the approach that we took so that we can ably answer these three questions. What is the state of entrepreneurship training? in African institutional higher learning. How do the existing entrepreneurial ecosystem support the development of youth entrepreneurial activities? And finally, what are youth perceptions of the support that they are receiving for their entrepreneurial endeavors? And I'm glad we have youth here, and I would really want to hear more perspectives from the youth that are in here in terms of what support are you getting and what do you want to be done for you to be able to do what we expect you to do? So I will stop here and invite my colleagues to proceed with the finding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I will start with the first uh, research question where we wanted now to get the landscape of what is really uh, existing, the entrepreneurship training in uh, these African universities, uh, the nine ones within the AAP. So um, actually there are a lot of efforts that have been taking place within these uh, university in Africa. So we found that um, all of them reported that there are programs uh, that are being taught within the university. Though there is diversity on what they're offering. So some of them are offering this uh, entrepreneurship training, but in terms of short courses, while others they take a long course. And also we found that uh, in some of the university, these uh, entrepreneurship training courses are taken as a mandatory, while in others they are taken as optional. And also it's sometimes debatable also when you look at the year study at which they are offered. So I find some of them they're offering even when the students are at the first year. While others are saying, oh, oh no, we can offer them during the last year where, while they are nearly graduating. So also highlighting them, not all of them will be employed, so they should also venture to self-employment. So um, regardless of that, they are offered, but these are uh, diversity uh, from one university to another. And also, really uh, an important uh, part uh, that also enhances uh, entrepreneurship in higher learning institution and these are uh, these support structures of innovation and business incubation so at least each of the nine country mentioned the existence of incubation within their campuses but also the mod the models are a bit different uh, some of them are taking uh, their ongoing students into the incubation phases, others are taking the graduates, and also there is variation of even the support services that are offered within those incubators. But at least you can see that the initiatives of supporting uh, the youths uh, within the university that have or are venturing into being entrepreneurs. But in addition to that, uh, in all these higher learning institutions, I found that they really are imagine to conducting research, advisory, and even outreach uh, related to entrepreneurship. But on the other hand, regardless to what uh, is being offered uh, within these higher learning institutions, there are some gaps that we have found. So um, in conducting these uh, entrepreneurship training, um, if you really want not to opt to the traditional models, you want to use maybe a problem learning, experiential learning kind of uh, delivery models, uh, it requires some uh, additional training resources. 
So um, we found that uh, there was a gap, uh, a lot of limited resources in these uh, training facilities, uh, even the number of um, trainers, because uh, for for the university that want to make sure that these training are offered as a mandatory, maybe to all the first year or fourth year. Now the population of the students vis-a-vis -vis the numbers of facilitators um, is really not uh, balanced. And also we found that uh, these are focus on the training facilitators. And I think uh, it was even, uh, earlier mentioned by one of the speakers, even the ones that who are now delivering these courses, maybe they're a bit while you know things are really changing and dynamics so even the one who is teaching you maybe uh, during his or her time they are not into uh, entrepreneurship uh, perspective or mindset and also um, there's this issue also of the limited uh, focus on mindset and that do not change especially now from the perspective of the students themselves so still uh, we found that um, they have still that mindset of being employed, thinking of white collar jobs and so forth. So there's still uh, a, a need for mindset change. And also, uh, I mentioned as earlier that there is diversity, so there isn't a standard format or mode of delivery uh, into these uh, entrepreneurship trainings. And also, most of them, uh, when we ask how are they also being uh, delivered and also um, their content and so forth, you find most of them are more of theory based, even it's, you know, lecturing face um, modes of uh, delivery and less of practical skills and so forth. So you even wonder someone is being taught about uh, marketing, research and all that, but it's just in class. While well, they're supposed to go out there, conduct a thorough market research, getting at least the potential uh, customers who will be were able to buy the products or even finding the potential investor and so forth. So um, this was uh, also a uh, gap that found and also uh, we need also um, context specific at least uh, practice guides and even uh, this is also something that I personally encountered sometimes the first time producing um, the topic on entrepreneurship and innovation and you prompt uh, to the students an example of any entrepreneur or innovator, okay, maybe in Tanzania or, if, or in Africa. Or you, you don't even mention the, the name of the country, just say, can you mention any one of them, yeah? You won't miss someone uh, talking about, I don't know, I don't know, Bill Gates. Where are they, you know, uh, Africans, entrepreneur innovators? Where do we have those uh, case studies within our curriculums? So uh, we created uh, context specific guides, and also um, some of these programs are not well integrated into the university structure, especially these uh, innovation incubation centers. You find they're like part-time or you know side-aligned uh, structure, not really uh, mainstream within the uh, university structure. And I've said also a lack of documentation of the links, what works, what not works within one African country to another. So also, um, when we also went to the second research objective, uh, research question that we're highlighting now on the ecosystem actors. So we found uh, in the field, um, there are a lot of actors that are uh, saying that uh, they're really uh, empowering youths and so forth, uh, the government, their with its respective departments, uh, there are these BDS providers, the higher learning uh, institutions, and the TVETs, financial institution, NGOs. Okay. So, um, in mind quickly, uh, everyone might have uh, the perspective of this TVET, yeah, his or her mind and service. But actually, on the right hand side, you'll find that that's actually what we found on the service ground. So, we find even training uh, is being provided by BDS providers, even some of the financial institutions, each of them declared themselves. Uh, so sometimes, um, for example, one uh, uh, quickly highlighted to me, like if they are offering maybe a mentorship or training, you find the youths uh, beforehand, their thinking is, uh, will I get some incentives out of it, okay? Or will I get, um, you are taking me to incubation. Will you give me certificate at the end? Yeah. 
So you wonder, uh, is the TFTS while you're being incubated, yeah? Is it the, what, what is the youth's uh, perspective in what is value for them, okay? Also, uh, these uh, actors, though they say there are many and they're delivering different uh, support services, but actually the ecosystem is fragmented. And um, there is lack of coordination. You might find you go to one um, uh, key stakeholders, you ask if do you know another one, actually they are actually duplicating uh, support services and so forth, but there's no uh, proper coordination among themselves. And also, um, there's limited access to productive resources. So issues of finance, land, knowledge, and skills uh, is also uh, something we found is still uh, limited to some of these uh, actors, what they're providing. It's not actually uh, tailored or specific to act, uh, some of the youth ones, especially most of them, they're even now uh, focusing some of these productive resources to the rural areas for getting, I mean the urban for getting the rural areas. So the issue also of inclusiveness is missing in what these actors are providing. And um, this also aligns to the mismatch uh, that we found between the services that they're offering with respect to uh, the youth's needs. And also um, uh, the lack of standard training methods because you find uh, each stakeholder they're saying now they are also training and so forth, but actually um, there are no standard training methods that they're using, even the infrastructure to address their needs, especially to those uh, groups that have said um, they're at an analyzed level. So also um, there is inadequate uh, government support. We see uh, all the countries reported they have a lot of uh, policies, nice one for youth, for entrepreneurship within their country, even translating them to action. And I really like Dr. Ben uh, noted that too. So, and not only that, some of the, uh, the, these support services are coming from the, find the youth limited awareness that there are these available supports, okay, what is being offered and whom qualifies and so forth. And also, how do you access them, okay? Um, so now, um, on the third one now, when we went now to get the youth perceptions uh, from themselves on what they support and receive, uh, that could assist for the entrepreneurial endeavors. So on the support uh, that they received, uh, they highlighted that, okay, uh, we have received some of the support services in terms of training, mentorship. Uh, some of them is in equipment because some of the uh, key, um, the ecosystem actors do not offer uh, financial services direct to the uh, youths, so they look in, are you into agri or manufacturing or something, instead of giving you cash, maybe you're giving you a machine to do the agro processing and so forth. So it can also be in terms of equipment. And others, they're offering them uh, networking opportunities, giving them slots in different exhibitions or conferences or trade fairs and so forth. And also uh, some of them are giving them funding opportunities, but also the funding uh, modes are different, okay? Uh, so some of them are given in terms of loans, some in terms of uh, just grants, and some of them um, maybe according to milestones, that's when they're being delivered and so forth. So it, they can be there, but uh, their modes also is differs and also the amount that they get. But uh, also these uh, youth, they said uh, no matter what, uh, these uh, ecosystems are supporting them, but uh, gaps uh, into them. So it's the mismatch with what are their needs. So here, again, we insist of also getting the voice of, of the youth. And I liked uh, one colleague saying this is what they want. But actually, is that really what they are, they, their needs are? And also, um, there is limited access to financial support uh, from the available institutions. And we find that most of the financial institutions, yeah, and that we could clearly see from uh, the previous discussions, they are actually focusing on the ones that are already established or already they have proof of concept from the idea and so forth. But when we look, especially from our context in the university, students, especially who are still ongoing with their studies, they're still doing, uh, they, they're at the stage of idea generation, refining them, they have prototype, they still now need to do uh, improvement with their prototype. They're not, you know, uh, market or investment ready. So uh, 
the ones that uh, need to go there at least to reach the stage where they can commercialize, they can upscale. So still um, the limited access for financial support to them. And also some of the skills or the trainings offered are not tailored uh, to what they really require. And also the enabling environment, okay. Um, most of them uh, reported also the cost of doing business is really high for them, especially when they are starting up. And also there's really high competition to already established business. And I don't know in the case of Botswana, but in Tanzania there's really high competition. Uh, so maybe uh, products coming from China, there are many, they're cheap and so forth. And you can imagine uh, a youth starting a uh, business majoring into similar business uh, from the import from China. So the issues of, so of tax is really major from a lot of youth. They say you are starting, people are coming to collect their taxes and so forth. So this was, was also something they add out. And also bureaucracy in accessing uh, these, some of the services and also uh, if the financial institutions are offering uh, them services, their interests are a bit higher. And also the lack of entrepreneurship career guidance and program. And I really liked, I don't know, one who uh, pr pr discussed and mentioned that actually we don't uh, inculcate that culture of entrepreneurship even at an earlier age. Even if when we have our uh, career guidance, I don't know among you who uh, during the career guidance programs, they had an entrepreneur actually coming and assisting them to pursue in that. I recall uh, the ones who are being welcomed are doctors, you know, engineers, pilots, and all that, yeah. But uh, if we, this is something that uh, is also uh, missing and really limited. So if you groom someone uh, from the beginning to have that perspective of uh, being an entrepreneur from an earlier stage, uh, at least to inculcate that culture earlier on. So also um, there's this, uh, aspects of mentorship and coaching is really important within the context of uh, being an entrepreneur, but it's really uh, unstructured uh, the way it is uh, being offered. Um, what action then uh, are we proposing that we should take? So um, we think with all these uh, fragmented uh, ecosystem actors with all the good intention that they want to have, uh, we should establish a strategic framework, uh, for example, having intermediary institutions that can at least coordinate uh, these entrepreneurial activities so that we have a good and successful implementation. And also, uh, we, we, all the, these, uh, maybe the research has been conducted and so forth. Yes, it's good to invest in them, but let's invest in actionable research. Let's also have a monitoring, uh, learning uh, evaluations of these uh, uh, researchers and what is placed in the field so that we also have, and we document now also these uh, learnings and all the evolving uh, needs of the youth in the ecosystem. Also, uh, the issue of uh, fund, uh, if we could create a dedicated uh, fund that is also a uh, youth-friendly uh, uh, financial product so that at least we can provide uh, startup capital for these uh, young <coughs> entrepreneurs. Let's also invest in these uh, support structures for these uh, youths, particularly the innovation hubs, the incubation uh, facilities that are in the higher learning institutions. Uh, also, uh, let's uh, invest also in, uh, in offering uh, and improve the quality and coverage of the infrastructure. Uh, also, the issues even the road, the energy, so that at least we can even uh, reach the youths that are not here in the city of Gaboron, even in all other uh, areas in Kerio. So, uh, also, um, it, it has also talked around uh, from the beginning the issue of um, curriculum. So we need to facilitate curriculum reforms so that we integrate um, the issues of entrepreneurship uh, education systems. And also, uh, let's work together, let's promote to have a greater partnership between city of Botswana, Luanda, Universal Dalam, all uh, within our regional uh, level, so that at least all the ecosystem members, we can facilitate these entrepreneurial active, uh, activities and also be, let's bring the gap between the theory and the practice in our curriculum reviews. Let's see, invite the, all these actors while we are reviewing our curriculum. I'd like to welcome Sarah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm <laughs> coming back there. Yeah, I think you should. I, I was going to stop at 
Yeah. Uh, we are intending to put the slides. Okay. Our daughter could talk with this slide and reflect. This is a call to action. Imagine, we want to be milking a cow, but we are not feeding it. Mm. If we feed this cow, our education system, mm. if one university can interact with about, mm. um, about 10,000 mm -hmm. students, Imagine in Africa, we had those 1,225 mm. universities and they are the catalyst mm. to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. You want competences, mm. you want skills, mm. let's invest in them. Mm. But it's not just about in investing in the higher education system, but there's a message for all of us. We all have a part to play. Let's act collaboratively. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's give them another huge applause for a very impactful and quite informative presentation. Um, I'm aware earlier we had uh, men at the podium but we are privileged that it's women leading now and when women lead we actually become successful so I have a question for each of the uh, speakers and then I'll open it up to to the audience I'll start with dr. Sarah uh, uh, my first question to you is that um, from your report uh, from the studies that you carried out uh, attitude and mind it's, it's it comes up very strongly um, why is this important and what type of a um, mindset and attitude is for this transformation we want to achieve? Okay, thank you. Um, I think I would start by saying this also has come out through the discussions that we had here. The issue of mindset. You know, we've ever heard of this uh, saying that you cannot force a horse to drink water. So it has to start with getting the entrepreneur themselves to realize what they can do. They have to be trained in such a way that they see that being an entrepreneur is not looking for somebody to just come and give you something, but they are just being given a platform so that they can realize their dreams. So the issue of mindset is now not only, although it was coming from the ecosystem actors, they were mentioning, but you know, when we focus on the youth, even if we try to support them in this way, it seems like we are forcing them. They don't want to do it. But there are others in there. They just need to be guided. I like the collaborator, uh, um, um, the, the speaker, in the last conversation. He said, no, the youth have the energies. They are innovative. Let's channel that energy in path. That's where we are coming in, the issue of the mindset of the attitude. It's not about short game. It's not just money but there's a lot of value and support that is there and it also reflects on the attitude of the facilitators themselves the higher education institutions let's change our attitude and say we need to change how we can impart the mindset that is needed to really forge ahead with entrepreneurial activity uh, thanks a lot you know you're very right mindset and, 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 and attitude because um, with young people we need to spark that interest so that they can pursue to Juliana uh, you've talked a lot about the role that higher institutions can play other than curriculum development what do you think uh, just uh, two or three things that um, other than just curriculum development and teaching what role do you think they can they can play beyond that that they can play, particularly I would like to enforce on support structure for innovation hubs and those. Those are really important. Okay, you can train, but then uh, after that, it's such a leakage in the pipeline. Okay, you've taught them in class or they've done the experimental learning. So what? The student has that innovative idea. You need to have a support structure for them now to implement those to test those ideas, to scale those ideas, to call the 
promote those ideas. And we found that most of the other ecosystem actors, they uptake those youths when they're at at least a higher level, okay? So who is now uh, assisting them at that, uh, uh, at the angle of the pipeline when they're starting that journey? So I think the, the role that the university has to play, we really have to enhance this in, in university-based incubators and these innovation hubs. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your answer. So we don't have a lot of time, so I will uh, allow you to also comment and ask questions. So there should be a roving microphone. I can borrow your days with that. Uh, show by raising your hand. Um, my sister at the back there will start with her, and then who else? That the mic can go straight. We'll take two people. Okay, let, let's start, and then, and, then, and then we go there. Thank you. And then also, intro, like, tell us who you are and where you are from when you ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Komuto Jongna uh, from the University of Botswana. I'm also an entrepreneur. Oh, I'm longer a youth. Yeah. I'm, okay. Um, Thank you for the presentation. I also want to go back to the previous comment that I made. I was teaching uh, year threes, uh, community development. And this girl raised her hand and said, Dr. J, the problem is we meet you after 15 years of schooling and you want to tell us that we can enterprise social work. Who is enterprise it except you? We are here, we are left two semesters. So we cannot be trying all those things that you are talking about. So what this person was saying was, it's been engraved in them that go and become a social worker and then you go and work. So what I'm saying is that the role of the university should be partner, should, the university should partner with the Ministry of Basic Education in trying to create a curriculum that will stimulate entrepreneurship from young age. At the university, out of 100, you'll only have one semi-entrepreneur, not full entrepreneurs, because at university level, it's about getting a degree and going out. So maybe at universities, we need to partner with the ministry and create a curriculum that will help and stimulate entrepreneurship. There should not be a gap between university and basic education. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I am Dr. Chizirondi Mudau from the University of Venda. I'm the HOD for Youth in Development. I just want to say something. Uh, it might be a question or a comment. Yeah, I was listening since morning here, but I didn't hear anyone talking about ITS, which is Indigenous Knowledge System, where it can be part of entrepreneurship. And what we have to do is to conscientize these young people on the issues of Indigenous Knowledge System. Even here in Mutsuama, we, we have some Mopani worms that are coming from this side in our area at South Africa, where you find that some new people cannot be part of that. They think it's for old people. Therefore, I need, I, I think we need to uh, change their mindset and show them that you can start your own business by starting, by doing just small things that are there in your country. Selling Mopani worms is a very big thing that you can make a business for yourself. And we have also our own, um, instead of having a commercial farm, you can do something on your subsistence farm and you can sell a lot of things from whatever you plow in your own village or your own farm, a small farm in your village. Therefore, I think IKS is very much important. We have that degree in our university where we are giving these young people skills so that when they finish with the degree, they should start their own businesses. Talking about issues of IKS, you might be maybe focusing on herbal issues because there are people who uh, believe in 
those herbs, then you can do that as a business. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take uh, one more. I don't forget. Just one more. We can take my sister here, and then we will answer, and then we'll go back another last round. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Amani Dube, um, representing the youth of South Africa. I'm so happy to hear you say that now. Um, to this is just a comment that I feel that we've westernized entrepreneurship as well. As an African nation, we should be really focusing on how does business in Africa work for Africans. I'll give you an example. TikTok um, is a social media platform. The Chinese have mastered the art of thinking in such a way that TikTok in, um, influences in, in China, for an example, are only awarded or given money or paid when they are advertising anything that has to do with entrepreneurship, leadership, um, well thought, thought out. But in Africa, you'll dance and look stupid, and then you'll be paid. Th these are all the initiatives that we should be thinking about as a nation, as youth, and make sure that we don't fall into those cracks, because that's another way of capitalizing us mentally. Thank you. Thank you, my colleagues. You can um, respond, but speak to to, to them, from Dr. John and colleagues from South Africa. Okay. Um, I'll comment. I totally agree with the issue of that you can't start talking about entrepreneurship at a higher level, that it has to start down there. And developing curricula has to be done collaboratively because it's a system. The way they're being taught down there, if, if not in a right way, it will still end up not meeting the results that are needed. So I totally agree with that. And secondly, on the issue of high education institutions, from the findings, it has been uh, shown that the universities now are now creating these platforms, the innovation and business incubation hubs or centers. And these are the platforms where they are now departing a bit in terms of the approach that it's not a certificate, it's not a degree, but it is a platform where they're saying, well, we need to nurture your idea, give space, be able to um, try it out, experiment, so that when you go out there, the funds are looking for someone who knows what they are doing. And it is through there, that's where the issues of, um, we feel that's where the issues of mindset and getting them ready, risking them, can happen there to some level. Then they can now connect better with the other players now that are out there, where they're implementing or they are funding. So, yes, universities, they have the windows, and this is where we need to see how best can we invest in these windows they really act to support what is happening in Africa. And the last speaker, that's spot on indeed. We should be proud of our own issues within Africa. And that's where we were focusing on. We, have, we do not have much investment in terms of research so that we can know what are you doing in South Africa. It's really cool to be able to do something African. It's really so it's all those that we need the information flow, the evidence to be able to showcase that this works, this doesn't work in our own context. You're going to speak maybe to the mic. Okay. Uh, I would like to comment uh, and agree with him, uh, the issue of uh, enrolling with uh, other collaborators like Ministry of Education and uh, ensuring that these issues of entrepreneurship start from um, the young. But um, also at the, because they are babes in the jar, so those are the ones that are the, uh, going to our universities. So if we can get a good ground of what's going to our university, that's the best. But then if they're already there and the foundation hasn't been laid, now it's for the university, especially in looking on at which we are they offering these uh, entrepreneurship. Maybe they shouldn't just wait at the year four or year three, 
January graduation, which could start maybe at year one, year seven, or causes as other causes maybe of uh, development could be very appropriate. And then uh, I'd really appreciate uh, that, Madam, and I acknowledge uh, UB for having this ICS uh, degree course. It's really uh, important, and uh, we should really uh, not forget about this and issue vision and tables and so forth. I have a good example of one of our incubators here at the University of Dar es Salaam incubator during the time of COVID. Uh, that person had um, developed one of these uh, medicine that is really helpful. Uh, in addressing uh, the uh, corona issue. And uh, also uh, I'd like uh, to acknowledge also the health representative from South Africa. Yeah, let's be also seeing Africa. That's really important. Thank you. Okay, the last round, I think we start with him and then go to my sister and we'll conclude with my friend here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anthony uh, Chapoto. I am the technical uh, director for regional network for agriculture policy research institutes, and I'm also associate director for Indab Agriculture Policy Research Institute in Kenya. I have a few, but I'll try to be brief. There's the issue of inclusiveness. That's number one. We've always talked about gender. Fine. There is rural and urban. I have not heard anything about it. If you, you see, one thing that my heart always bleeds, when I compare my kids and kids of those in the rural areas, you find that there is a huge divide. So there's a huge divide in terms of just thinking about entrepreneurship for urban kids and rural kids. So I think we should not forget that, that angle in, term, in terms of entrepreneurship. The education system that one gets in the rural area, and the education system that one gets in the urban area is totally different. I will not go into the issues of using technology, for example. You find that it's a big divide. Number two, I think we, I mean, growing up, I'm not that young, I'm very old. Uh, I used to have all the opportunities on earth. I mean, my parents were not that rich, but the education system I went through, very great. But, you find that I was never taught of becoming a business person, primary school. I mean, we used to do vegetable gardens. And that. But when my kids went to school, I mean, they went to one of the schools, you find that the one of the modules was how to run a business. So they would come home, they would borrow money from us to run the business. But in our schools, you find that that does not happen at all. So how do you become an entrepreneur? The other issue, I think, has to do with uh, Tibet. You know, it's like those who use their hands can create jobs. Those who use their hands are likely to survive than those that probably just dance. I mean, it's tough to be on TikTok and, and right? But those who use their hands, the builders, the hairstylists, uh, so many opportunities. So it's, I think we, I mean, I've noticed that in our countries, all the vocational training schools are on the, I mean, on the decline. So I think they need to reinvest in those uh, vocational training schools. Yes, I know universities are important as knowledge partners, but I think investing in, in, in vocational training, I think is important. Last but not least, how many of us primary school teachers in here. Do we have any? How many are doctors? Doctors? <laughs> doctors of anything. I had some doctors. Of anything. <laughs> PhDs. And, uh, so you'll find that we are missing. We have a missing link. In this room, there should be those from primary and basic education. All of us, we are yeah, I mean, we're good researchers, but I think we are missing the fundamental opportunity to educate those that are supposed to educate the basic person, our young, young people. Thank you.
Okay, hello. My name is uh, Seven Wube from Tanzania. And I am a creative, and you have uh, talked about dancing. I'm a dancer by profession. Yes. And thank you. <laughs> and I do, um, I do a lot of stuff. Um, I have a degree in mass communication. I do media works, PR, and promotion for I freelance um, in different companies as a promotion or influencer. So when we were talking about uh, entrepreneurship, I was looking at my part also that there is a lot of opportunities in the digital creative spaces also, and we should also prepare um, the youth, us in particular, for the future, which is more of, you know, uh, robots and, and um, more updated software, things like that. So and in, more un in many universities, there is no um, training prog programs or uh, digital trainings, you know, for, for the youth, like to create people who are more in database administrations or cybersecurity experts or data science software developers, things like that. We should also emphasize in these spaces because there's a lot more of opportunities in these spaces because like for me in my spaces uh, in my field I have managed to you know to pay for my for my university fees just for my dancing and for this digital um, you know uh, opportunities that are there. so we should also focus on this because our world is going to a digital era now so yeah thank you Good morning or afternoon. Yeah. Because of this uh, long time, so good morning. Uh, good afternoon again. My name, I don't introduce myself in, uh, earlier on. Uh, out of the university, uh, I also do create a program that professor Jordan program, specifically related to our, our research science and technology and innovation. I also have a number of projects that also doing the RSTI, Research Science, Technology and Innovation Base. And uh, fortunately, our projects that we did uh, at uh, the United Nations uh, uh, camp last, uh, last month uh, got positioned to global, I mean, uh, regional. I was collaborating with uh, colleagues from South Africa, Cameroon, and Nigeria. Africa is a village. What you are saying is that uh, there should be um, skills on digital uh, digital technologies, software development, and so forth. We have those a lot of those in uh, in our country. So, you know, you know, uh, it's just to highlight where is the market flooded, and then have those where the market uh, move to where the market is not flooded through partnerships, alliance for partnerships. So, has uh, question uh, answered the question that uh, I had in mind that uh, entrepreneurship stimulation. I was asking myself, entrepreneurial stimulation in what? And then the, the answer that he has provided is the use of hands. The use of our hands and our minds and what we are able to create, what we are at best at, what we are best at. Um, take for an example in China and developed countries. Um, they develop, they, 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 the son, the daughter adopts what the father has been doing so long. If the father has been developing uh, 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 rims, vehicle, they are going to be best at that. Maybe add some technologies into what they have been developing. So it is imperative now to say that grassroots development is also important to highlighting what 
us as Africans are bet, uh, best at. A child is best at dancing maybe at a, at a younger age. The question is, how do you now enterprise what you are best at? Then they become best entrepreneurs at what they are best at. Because we have a number of entrepreneurship programs up to masters. Uh, people, uh, some of, uh, maybe some of us here have got uh, degrees in entrepreneurship. But the question is, we can't be entrepreneurs because we are theorized, theorized the, the idea of entrepreneurship that is theoretical now. But the question is, the problem, and the question is, the problem is that we now as Africans undermine the capacities that young people have at a grassroots level. It means then that need for programs that are ta tailor-made programs that are specific to young people, maybe at a, at a grassroots level, maybe primary level, to say that this child is best, at, I was best at art, very be I was the best at art at school when I was, I was, I was, I was at primary school. But because by, th by then there was not this kind of program that we can now question and say this child is best at, at art, then, then how does it become an then, um, so, um,
uh, but our retailer, they will catch up with us. All right. Um, good. So we are behind schedule at least by uh, 20, 27 minutes, going for 30. Uh, we should be able to catch up. Uh, what I would like to say, first of all, is to, uh, to mention that Before you broke for lunch, uh, the conversations are already on on what university. And uh, I, I like the conversation particularly related to uh, capacity development, not just to be about hubs, because sometimes we have these, the hubs becoming fancy uh, infrastructure that, you know, people, researchers and other work in them without really cascading this into the, the people who need the services. In other words, can we be linking um, what universities are doing in terms of incubation, linking it to the sectors in the economy, and particularly making sure that youth are central to, to those programs. Uh, another thing that we'd like to be able to achieve uh, with this uh, uh, session, which is the breakout sessions, uh, up to date and tight curricula. This is linking now to the hubs and the curriculum development. Uh, there is already existing curricula. Some of it may be reformulated in the next five years, whatever. But I think the, the for instance, the TVETs and vocational uh, uh, TVETs, VCTs, and others, those small institutions that are really very important because they are big in the economy, but we think they are small. How do we integrate those? and make sure that they have the, cap the requisite capacity to be able to deliver on youth programming. If you need electricians, if you need plumbers, if you need mechanics, if you need you know, people who actually can do all kinds of things, technology, all right, the, the technology that we need, how do we ensure that our education system in the TVETs is linked to those industries in order to drive the economy so that you can use the skills from those institutions uh, to either find a job because the jobs might be there in the industry, maybe they are limited, I, for instance, in our economy here in Botswana, we know that you know, the jobs may be limited, especially after COVID. But looking at the TVETs or VCTs, the question is, how can we use the programming there and or capacity or make it better and relevant in such a way that youth can use it to develop their own businesses? Right. I see on the street, Boroni and some, if you go to Bunkeng and other places along the streets, you see uh, welding. All right, there must be an industry, there must be a market for the, for the welding businesses. So can we ensure that youth can actually this sustainability around those kinds of businesses by learning from um, the TVET and others the, the better skills to make sure they have better products? And also think about value chains as well, all right? Value chains. Um, and then uh, we all want what type of partnerships are needed these partnerships should be effective because we don't want, uh, we, we want to engage the private sector. We want to engage higher education. We also want to engage the policymakers in some ways so that policymakers may have nice and facing policies, but we want to say, all right, this policy is facilitating what we are doing. So the conversation around policy, uh, around partnership should be ease of the business, as an example. What can government do? You know, some of what you need to see. So partnerships that are needed and they need to be effective they have, to be, they have to be involved with multiple stakeholders, and they have to be facilitating youth empowerment. Knowledge production is another area. There is need for strengthening knowledge production, particularly uh, like University of Botswana, uh, University of Pretoria, who is a partner here, University of Dar es Salaam is a partner of AAP, and others. Bust in Botswana, and then uh, Lilongwe University of uh, Agriculture Science, uh, you know, Leona, as it's called. What are the role in business, and, and particularly agribusiness. So those are some we're looking at in terms of knowledge production that is linking youth to employment sectors, linking youth to entrepreneurship or business ideation and development of uh, their own business that can, they can use to employ others. 
And then moving out of that uh, with knowledge production, I, I, I talked about think tanks, centers of excellence. These can be regional, where there is sharing of knowledge, national as well, and I think for them to be national, we're saying um, they are being responsive to the context. Because what's happening in terms of the economy in Botswana it will be different from, say, market in Malawi, and then when you go to Dar es Salaam, there's also uh, some differences in terms of you know, the, the economy, uh, economic activities as well. The role of women in the whole process as well. Right, community of practice, communities of practice, researchers, trainers, um, youth, uh, how do we build those communities of practice, you know, in order for them to collaborate? Then consolidated entrepreneurship ecosystem. You know, key stakeholders are still operating in silos. There's need for immediate institutions or institutions to coordinate their activities. And then, of course, last but not least, that is very important. Gender. How do we count uh, uh, women, young women's roles and, and representation, uh, and also people with disabilities. People with disabilities. How do we ensure that they are mainstreamed in, in the activities that we are? Doing? Okay. So, margin marginalized, vulnerable youth, uh, young women, uh, people with disabilities, uh, and then also ensure whatever economic activities that we do going to end up also perpetuating the divide, the digital divide, the where you find that oh, children who have access, parents, uh, middle class, they are the university lecturers, the teachers, middle class of our e countries, um, and they are the ones who are having access because they know what is happening at the University of Botswana today. The, the youth in Hansi, uh, or, or, or maybe based in uh, Morogoro, in, 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 in Tanzania, may not be having any access to this, to this information. So I think that's the guideline for the conversations we should be having and really getting deeper into some of these issues. So I'm going to ask a moment very quickly. Um, a, a young person uh, announcing the different groups. We're going to go into the groups, and then there will be youth facilitators. So she's going to say where everybody is going to, where everybody is going to be. So um, at this moment, I think, let me see what we want to do. Covered a lot. Antoinette Mulele, are you there? So you can come over and announce the. So um, for this room, we'll be having two groups. That's group three. Um, group three is the one about creating and sustaining effective multi stakeholder partnership and network for youth empowerment. Um, it's being facilitated by Dr. Benice Kagala. She's already sitting at the back there. That's where we'll be meeting her. Also, still in this very room, it's going to be group four, which is recovering pandemic, youth health, life skills, and well-being of the in the post-COVID-19 area. It's going to be facilitated by Prof. Malete. He's sitting in front. They'll be sitting here up front here. With uh, with Cone. Okay, with Nekone uh, Rapo. So after that, when you exit where we are entering, you look to the left. There are one, two, three doors that are open. The first one is for group one, which is facilitated by Laki Mudiakoni. Laki, you can stand up so that they can see you. Yes, the one for building capacity among new youth, young entrepreneurs in the SADC region. That's the first one, it's written room one. And then the second room, it's going to be facilitated by the CEO of Bitri. I'm sure he has a, he's already there, right? Mesheden Masupe. Um, if they are not yet here, we'll see the facilitating with. It's in group two, it's uh, room two. It's open, the second opened door. And then the last one, which is group five, that is facilitated by Dr. Chatachita um, about the creating decent jobs for youth digital transformation. That's the last one. It's in room three. Um, Dr. Tashaba, he is here. He has already seen the room, so he will leave you there. Just, just like yes. that. Okay, so going back again, I said in this room, it's 
group three and group four. Group three at the back, group four at the front. Going to the rooms, room one is group one, room two, group two, and then room three, group five. Saying it again, three, four, one, two, five. Three, four, and two, five. Is there any question? Yes. You can decide based on this. I'm, I'm told you have to decide which one is pure heart. Yes, what is pure heart? Let's go, that's I like that. <laughs> so we start with more people in one, but we'll, 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 we'll find a way to run around. Yeah. All the best. I'll be explaining who is going to go for Let's go now. Uh, again, um, I'll go around and then I'll announce when you're coming back. But make sure that you have very uh, instructive discussion and specific recommendations on what you need to do. All right? Yeah, so. Marmalade. So we, we are behind time now. It's uh, 2.39. So we have to make sure that we are done by 15, three o'clock. So uh, we're going to give you 30 minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes max. That means 10 past three. Yeah, 10 past three. Uh, three, three ten, we come back. Yeah, it is. I think we can just shut it down.
Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay, colleagues, I think uh, we can start. Um, I'm going to request that we must speak within the using the microphone so that the interpreters to interpret to our colleagues because he speaks uh, Portuguese. So, first, uh, let me, my name is Bernice Sahala. I'm from South Africa. So, my role is just to facilitate this group so that we can have a discussion. Um, uh, start off by introducing ourselves quickly, and then from there, I have um, requested one of the colleagues to volunteer to be a scribe and to present. So she has volunteered. I think she will introduce herself as well. Hello, uh, my name is Katlaro Mokheti. I'm from uh, Market Players in Botswana. I do entrepreneurship development. I've got uh, a membership of 350 entrepreneurs, uh, with of whom are youth, and we've developed uh, practical solutions thus far, so I, I'm optimistic we'll be able to shed some light on the perspective of youth in various sectors. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Dr. Matlala Mola. I represent Galashi Medical Group. We are a private company uh, that runs um, various facilities that provide primary health care. And we recently um, started a project that will be going to secondary health care as well. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Rankosha. I work for the Ministry of Youth. So, and uh, but I I do policy coordination. Good afternoon. My name is Uma Kebagote. I'm from Seychelles. I'm 23 years old, and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm here to represent the youth of Seychelles. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Debbie Mapman. I'm from the University of Botswana, uh, Department of Visual and Performing Arts. I'm a theater practitioner and a uh, university lecturer. Good afternoon. Sarah Gondor uh, from Academia, Department of Agribusiness Management from Malawi. Good afternoon. Boa tarde a todos. É, eu sou Elder Silva, é, sou quadro do Ministério da Juventude e Desporto de, de Angola e também sou dirigente associativo e juvenil e trabalho sobretudo com Partnership, which is an institution 
facilitate in uh, partnership with uh, institution of higher research institutes. Now we also provide capacity building as well as seed funding for the institutions. And uh, the youth area is one of those where we are very keen in uh, advancing, uh, particularly in terms of empowering young people in various uh, fields. Good afternoon. My name is Tabo Taylor from uh, the University of Chicago. The IT department has capacity building project development, also the development of uh, art projects such as Art Technology University, but I'm into R&D, research and development that much, uh, in the field of digital technology and uh, digital health. Thank you. Um, our topic um, which we are supposed to be discussing is on creating and sustaining stakeholder partnerships and network youth empowerment. Uh, I think the topic is very clear. First, uh, it means that there needs to be deliberate effort on the part of the or who have a relationship which is going to be sustained on a long-term basis for the benefit of the parties involved. So I think that is actually my understanding and my interpretation. But the group of by discussing what does it mean create and sustain multi-stakeholders uh, partnership. What, what, does it, what does it involve? I've given you the explanation, but then I'm sure we have a different explanation. I think first, let's just agree and brainstorm. There's no right or wrong answer, so people can just uh, brainstorm on what does it involve you know, to actually create and sustain multi-stakeholder partnerships and networks for youth empowerment. So the main purpose to empower young people. So let's just, um, you can just say anything that you want that you can basket. There's no right or wrong answer. Thank you. Um, okay. From my perspective as um, educator, from my understanding, from the, for me, empowering, empowerment, um, you know, empowering them in such a way that by the time they graduate, you know, what I've impacted, I'm going to use it in the field. Thank you. You know, the lecturer in me there was a blackboard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, empowering learners. Let's hear from others. Let's be quick because I think there are just quite a number that we are going to be asking. Hello. So, but from uh, from my perspective, as a let me let, let me take it as somebody who before before I get to the policies because much as we develop policies and ensure implementation, we have to ensure that at least our who who are our stakeholders. First we have to identify who are our stakeholders in youth work. And from the stakeholder perspective, we therefore say what role are the stakeholders going to be doing? So, but, uh, but, but, but from the government perspective, the stakeholders, firstly, we, 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 are, we are there for the young people. The young people themselves are very, very critical and they have to be given their to express, to keep 
partners in you those are stakeholders that are involved in ensuring that youth are also playing a bigger role be they be community be they be sponsors be those who are the young people uh, uh, to, to make sure that the young people Uh, but uh, just to kind of simplify, my is people have been talking to about uh, different organizations exist um, about those different organizations, be it government, be it in the private, um, be it in the um, learning institutions, because they have the same of um, empowering youth, how do they then come together to have, because they have the same mandate basically, how do they then come together instead of government having its own different policy, um, learning institutions having their own mandates and uh, policies, how do these institutions come together to make the same um, common goal? Bom, contributo no que a própria ação do governo no que diz respeito à juventude. Levando em conta que a ação da juventude é transversal, as políticas públicas para a juventude. com os setores, outros departamentos ministeriais. E é necessário que, acima de tudo, o jovem esteja em e seja capaz de poder contribuir tem a ver com isso. É necessário essa relação e a educação formal que deve acasalar-se com a educação informal. Comunidade, procurar encontrar parceiros, associações eh, de, na comunidade, eh, propostas que, que, que visam integrar os jovens na comunidade, há diferentes tipos de programas que existem. Acho que, por exemplo, no meu país, Angola. Uh, muitas muitas situações é, o jovem em certo momento não tem paciência para uh, lidar com questões muito burocráticas então é necessário que as políticas públicas no domínio da juventude sobretudo no que diz respeito ao fomento do empreendedorismo tem, sejam de forma simplificada é, hoje nós temos as tecnologias digitais que permitem por exemplo para mim, para, se conseguirmos evoluir no sentido de que, se eu, para alcançar um determinado financiamento, não precisa de cumprir aqueles critérios, mas que desde que tenha credibilidade e o meu programa ande, receba o financiamento. Mas, acima de tudo, a educação formal deve acasalar-se com a educação informal. Uh, na comunidade, aí onde está aquela que, que vende. Uh, and uh, there should also be information sharing so that within community we can have uh, uh, can influence and should be in a position to contribute to development of their communities so that their community can develop uh, youth um, development uh, initiatives. If we think about uh, uh, development policies uh, and youth empowerment, but youth should take part in those uh, initiatives. If um, if that's not the case, that uh, uh, policies cannot be uh, successful. We should always take in consideration aspects 
relating to take into account all those aspects that have been uh, negative and have not uh, helped to implement uh, those uh, initiatives. We should uh, analyze what went wrong and try to correct what, what went wrong. We should involve uh, uh, the, the youth in the dialogue with the social, with the, with the private sector and the from Angola. Yes, they have said a mouthful. Uh, sometimes when you uh, out this uh, views from his perspective, I think uh, it was a bit of uh, emotional. He was expressing exactly the environment that the youth is facing in terms of um, bur the bureaucratic issues that sometimes policies when they are created, youth are not involved. And this limits uh, the developments that youth usually come up with because the protect issues will then reflect back to what the youth has developed and say we don't have an, a, a policy that supports whatever that you have uh, you have done but uh, not taking into consideration that within our societies we see we have people that can uh, be able to create uh, solutions for the future currently for example we have a problem with 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 energy and i do believe that uh, there are um, young people that maybe are able to create solutions for such and there are those that also can create um uh, uh, solutions for digital health and, and and medicine and maybe they had created that initially uh, for that to exist the, the the medicines to exist to solve current problems but then it comes to the policy issues and where we have maybe government working hand in hand with its, its own people, uh, having its policies uh, working against its own people to say whatever that has, is the youth is trying to uh, develop or come up with does not uh, uh, coincide well with, 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 uh, with, with, um, with, with, with the police. So in this case, stakeholder engagement, from my own perspective, it's first situation analysis identify a situation, what is what is the problem that is at hand in the field currently? And how do we solve this problem? But before you come up with a, a, a question of how, then you have to engage, who to do we engage, who are involved in these problems? Uh, those are the first stakeholders that are, are, are to be engaged in that, 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 that perspective. Uh, th because we have second and primary stakeholder. So it means that for, for stakeholder, then you have to identify a problem. And secondly, you go to stakeholder analysis, as he had said. The first, uh, the first stakeholders that are engaged within that project are the very closest people to that problem. So that now when you coincide with your policies as government, uh, you, you assess those policies and, and check if those policies are coincide with how we would, yes, I would want to solve the problem that is at hand. So if you now we want to solve a problem, policies are not, uh, are not uh, aligning to those solutions then. We need also to go back to the drawing board and say, now, how do we now refine the policies? Very quick, because nowadays solutions they need to be presented very quickly, rapidly. We need solutions that are, you know, tomorrow or not, not the use of today is not of yesterday. They need solutions and you know in our situation in africa now it's a problem because it takes time for solutions to be presented and to be funded now we have time, but we also need solutions but the youth has got solutions to those problems if we could engage the youth first then afterwards we engage other parties then because they are the ones that are in the future not the current generation yeah, so that's that's uh, um uh, how I have to understand uh, stakeholder engagement. Thank you. I think we are going to wrap. We've got uh, two hands, and then from there, I'm going to summarize uh, what we've discussed, and then we move to the second question. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Antoinette. I just wanted to agree with what she's saying. But I wanted to just note that um, I don't think the problem is policy formation. 
But the problem is the ones who really make the decision as is being adopted, problem is. So if we could really push hard to make sure the government, the government does not, are not the ones who adopt the, the policies, would really go far. I'm just saying it from experience because I've been part of the policy making for agriculture. The policy that we made was made before I was even born. We did another one and when we got to the parliament I don't know what happened. But we really formed a good one that really accommodates um, needs and all that. That's number one. Number two, I would, I would say the issue of inclusion, youth inclusion. When we say we want to do something, there should be at least 30% at most, sorry, 60% young people there. Whatever we do, whatever, whatever we do, 60% should be young people. Because if we keep saying we want to do this and this and this, and 90% is adults, they will never understand how it feels to be on the other side. Yes. And then number three is collaboration. Collaboration includes the fact that um, young people should not just be present, but should be given such kind of roles to which we both do something, they do something. And it calls for uh, accountability. Okay, I'll, I'll just ask you what is the Delta saying. I think for me, my understanding is the issue of yes, coming together collaboratively, but the issue of uh, bringing in a win win situation so that yes, you're all working towards a common goal of youth empowerment each partner knows their role and they also appreciate that I am not a jack of all trades. That's why they that unit, there's that unit. And then in the end you have a win win situation where everybody has their and responsibilities and the consequences are there that if somebody does not do their role, this is what is going to happen. And with that win win situation then the sustainability issues will be able to come in. Okay, um, a quick one. Um, my thinking would be in trying to now come up with an actual way of creating such a effective multi-stakeholder partnership. We, we look at it from a sort of resource perspective, not look at what everything that is wrong with what government is doing, with what private sector is doing, with what institutions of learning and the general public is doing, to say, what is the untapped resources or what's available that we can leverage and make sure that moving forward we don't have a repetition of what we've experienced over, I think most of our uh, uh, member states are uh, about 20 to 50, 60 years of uh, independence, political independence, but economically can say the same. So what can we do to ensure that we don't have that repetition, a repetition for the next 50 years by literally looking at the resources that we haven't been tapping into, you know. Talk about um, institutions of higher learning. I'd be interested for us to look at retired professors and professionals to say, okay, you were part of in the first national development plan and national strategy. What, where do you think you missed it? You were part of developing it, you were part of uh, rolling it out. Where do you think you missed it? What can you advise us at, as the young people? Because as young people, we, we, we are radical, which is good. We've got, ener we've got energy, which is good need that sort of guy to say, okay, this is how you don't miss it. Because at some point, they were as us and excited and, and radical the same way. But uh, we find ourselves in a place where there's no con continuity. So I'd like for us to sort of look at, okay, what is untapped in government? What is untapped in the and so on and so forth in our so that we find practical uh, solutions that actually we can probably even in our uh, presentation have timelines and deliveries, uh, uh, like actual measures. Thank you. Okay. In addition to a win-win situation, ju it's going to be just short. Also the youth, because most of the youth nowadays are involved and actively engaged. But the problem now is, what is it in for them? Because at the end of the day, they might maybe be saying, yes, no, these people are not working hard, stuff, stuff like that. But they also contribute to the society. What is it in for them? Of course, yes, we are talking internships and all so, so forth and so forth, which if we look all across Africa, they are different. There are those that are so much beneficial as opposed to others. But let's try and see a system that, you know, accommodates also 
and not to say that who was in a dictatorship then what happened to that particular individual who also was maybe if you are uh, uh, under the policy um, subject and maybe you are under an dictatorship or someone who's elder in policy making so you engage in a, a certain policy that was made but in the, in the process you only benefit you know what you get in the basis but afterwards what happens after your internship uh, as, a, as your experience in designing a certain policy so a win-win situation in that within our society and see each other as partners um, th this is quite exciting um, in my career I have actually been committed to dealing precisely with this uh, challenge of how do you really build partnerships. And one thing I've learned is that uh, what you need to do is to move towards a build a coalition of willing partnerships. Within the context of building partnerships, you know, you need to begin to look at uh, bring on board those who have legitimacy in those partnerships. Because there's no point in bringing American, you know, others who are out. Point, you know, in, in uh, all stuff. I mean, you know, <laughs> to to be the drivers of uh, you know an agenda which is youth focused. We don't have legitimacy. We need to look at uh, those who have legitimacy. I'm just coming out from a meeting with the vice chancellor and the ADB director. We're saying precisely the same. If we're to get in terms of our intervention at the SADC level, who has got legitimacy within the context of the bank? I, as in terms of, you know, most of the institutions of higher learning, we don't have legitimacy because the bank responds to government. So government has, a, you know, you know, legitimacy in the funding. So, so you look at this situation and say, you know, if we want to get money from ADB, the government should be part of it. So you look at each situation, look at who has legitimacy for ourselves to really move our agenda forward. You know, if you're looking at uh, in the agriculture sector for many years, you know, I, I was with NEPAD, and there we found out, and I still support, you know, government, we found out that uh, what you need, again, is civil society organizations, because they can exert pressure, and so they've got legitimacy. With governments, you fear, I mean, there are countless citizens and therefore citizens become important to be part of the partnership so you don't leave them out you know on that you also need to define some tactics how do you really you know consolidate this uh, you know agenda you know of a partnership? how do you sustain it so you need tactics, you know and those sometimes you know are about maybe bringing champions into the partnerships you need some you know powerful voices you know sometimes you may even bring in outsiders you know, who probably have more credibility. You bring from UN, or you bring this guy, I mean, who is famous, to really be your champion, to be part of the partnerships. So, so you, you may need to do a number of tactics in terms of selling your product or your agenda to ensure that uh, you know, it moves on. It's going to uh, building a new brand, because somebody may bring in, you know, a brand into your, uh, you know, partnerships. So who are these who can help you to build that drama, you know, brand and, uh, you know, interest from others? Thank you, Prof. I think that uh, then takes us to to the next question. Um, in within um, the within SADC, um, who who actually has legitimacy? I think we need to identify a Prof already mentioned can find other stakeholders in that regard okay uh, yeah okay go ahead government uh, civil society organization uh, definitely um, but um, I, I, I've worked a lot with CS organizations and um, Yes, there's a lot of legitimacy, but we also need to check what we mean by legitimacy because you, you find that um, even if there's dispensation and they get certain funding, it's 
often trickle down to the members equally or with the same opportunity. So we might get funding, give it to a non-profit organization and say, dispense X amount and ensure that the youth are empowered through this uh, resource. But you find one, two, three people are benefiting within that organization. So some of the ways that we also need to check to ensure that um, the monitoring and evaluation aspect of it as well ensures that we're able after we established you as a legitimate organization, because you checked box one, two, three, did you then follow through? How many uh, of your youth members benefited from this much? How many have since been able to create jobs? How many have since been able to uh, contribute to, to the economy by way of, okay, let's see how much taxes were paid by your entrepreneurs that we empowered. I think it would be very stringent in how we monitor and evaluate um, the, the after effects of that station because a lot of what happens is I will have I want to give an example of nonprofit organization I've got 350 entrepreneurs so it means that uh, uh, hours are free subscription but most of the time you find that if I'm saying that they should pay subscription fees, I'm already dis marginalizing a large community and uh, most of these are rural people with uh, rural communities with disability women you know a lot of SMEs really even if you ask them to pay $20 per month, that's a lot of money. It's not money that just comes, even if it's $10, it's a lot of money. So you are sort of inadvertently cutting them out of the system. So these are things that we need to look into. Is the kind of civil society organization that we're talking about inclusive in terms of accessibility? What kind of membership does it comprise of? Does it really appeal to the average person? Because that enables access. I've got 350 entrepreneurs who are subscribed, but if there's an opportunity, I don't say I'm just looking at my membership. First of all, the membership doesn't pay any fees, so already they've got free access. But what we do is we look at who are the competitive entrepreneurs who make good use of the community and actually put Botswana, for example, uh, we are based in Botswana, on the map and show the competitiveness of youth in the world. You understand? So I think those are some of the ways we need to ensure that even when we say legitimate, it's not just on paper. Um, I was going to say that I agree with him, and I was going to raise, um, adding on to what he's saying, and emphasizing something someone just said about basically division of labor. We have this big task that needs to be done, and sometimes breaking it into small groups, just as what we are doing right now. There's a group here, there's a group there. We're all tackling the problem, but in small different versions and um, parts. Sorry. So I'm thinking, from what he's saying, best thing would be first of all identifying what needs to be the last BOT who should do it when it comes to the issue of legitimate who makes the rules on what should be legitimate who makes the rules and where do the youth play the role in there I'll give a very good example there are so many um, big NGOs that fund I'll talk about Botswana because I'm from Botswana and 90% of the time us young people have access to that money Usually rules are as simple as you cannot pay your salary. Um, you can only do certain kind of projects. When you go there, you have to take care of your transportation, your food, your means of living. So basically, it becomes a lot difficult for a young person to access that fund. Why? Because it's not really going to help them. They do not have any other source of income. But if you take it from another level, take it from the big page, picture first and breaking it down to the small pieces. That's where we now do the whole thing of labor, knowing what needs to be done, legitimacy, how do we define legitimacy to the last BOT, what rules need to be done for that legitimacy, and how do we make sure that we achieve the big vision in small pieces and small steps at a time. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I just wanted to add from hearing from the two, I'm picking one issue about identification and uh, whether within the uh, member states there are youth driven structures or like youth voices a coordinated voice that will be able to push for what is supposed to be happening but yeah i was glad uh, the mentioning of the national youth councils yes which is now the government that are driving that mm -hmm. but to what extent are the structures that we have within the member states 
that bring out this youth voice as one, as you're saying the issue of, yes, you have funding there, but because the requirements are making it that I still have to do one, two, three things, and in the end, the youth are not able to access. And if that, as an example, be something that is being said with one voice that, no, you're still not able to reach us. It's because of these things that as one voice I'm saying the voices are there, but we are limited we can only from A to H. From H going forth, usually decisions are made by the government. It goes back to the point where I was saying that sometimes it becomes a bit difficult because as a young person like I am, no matter what we are fully in the private sector, unless if you are given those opportunities where you sit in those board and whatever. But to get to those positions, you really have to work hard. I don't know if it's working hard or luck lack or chance, but whatever it is, it's a bit difficult still for young people to really find their space in the. Okay, thanks. I think I just want us to elaborate a little bit more. Um, it looks like from what you are saying that there are actually challenges in stakeholder engagement, particularly in the youth development space. Uh, the first challenge which I noted was what was said earlier. The, the, the fact that uh, you know young people will say what 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 are going to gain out of the process um, you know that is actually the challenge where you find that young people don't actively participate in issues that affect them and then the other issue which came um, from you know right there when 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 there was a discussion is the issue of uh, you know question of youth I think that is what uh, you know has been mentioned the fact that People get co-opted because um, you find uh, national youth council structures such as national youth councils, for an example, they are actually politicized. And um, the other challenge is the issue of uh, decisions that are taken already by government. Then you find that uh, young people are just uh, rubber stamping decisions that have already been taken. So can we just uh, elaborate more on the challenges that? Uh, are being encountered in this re uh, regard so that we can just uh, elaborate a little bit more. So I just want you to focus your attention on the challenges. So, you know, those challenges then will help us in coming up with the solutions on how we can sustain the So let's just elaborate a little bit more on challenges. Thanks. Is there any additional, are there any additional challenges um, from what I've already mentioned? Is there anything that we've missed? Uh, no, I was going to just, maybe if may I just elaborate on the issue of legitimacy. Um, that the question would be, how would we know that an uh, organization run by a particular youth is legitimate, why we don't have uh, we don't give them a chance to be able to exercise whatever role that they are given. So it goes back to of uh, regulations that uh, deliberately excludes uh, such organizations that have been used newly by young people, not necessarily meaning that they cannot be able to exercise a particular role, only because of those regulations that were established. For example, maybe we could say that, I could give you an example of maybe we say um, we need someone who's good in programming with a job uh, at that, but we need someone with five years experience. But then you look at what someone who is a young person who's good at programming, even other languages, but one who's got five years experience uh, does not have those fresh minds to maybe push the organization to a certain point and even be able to push the organization uh, where it's supposed to go and come up with fresh maybe new ideas of what is required within the market and might be required within the market in the long run. So we, we, we leave behind young people because of this uh, regulations. But most importantly, we fail to understand the monetary and evaluation aspect, as she has said, that the monetary and evaluation aspect will tell the results. And Legitimate, uh, got legitimate, which we are saying still has got legitimate. So
So what legitimacy is that organization if then it doesn't have reports, it doesn't have validation framework that we can be able to validate that indeed organization, this organization is legitimate. Thanks. I, I want we are to wrap up. We've got ten minutes now. I want you to focus build partnerships. I think we didn't actually do much just uh, on that. I think the valuable input came um, that we need to build coalitions of willing partners. So can we just uh, do that so that we can cover everything that you have? Okay. Um, th this is what I believe, um, and w we've done it, and I believe I it's somewhat tried and tested. Um, um, some time late 2020, we attended a... a, a, a an open summit with government, uh, with just policy makers and technocrats. I hope this is not an offensive word. <laughs> with technocrats and and entrepreneurs, and we were institutional framework for the organisations that we're going to be instrumental in developing a strategy for a trade agreement. Um, how are we going to do a new strategy? And master plan. We get there presented with a framework of government from Office of the President right through to uh, Development Finance Institution, BOSI, and then you've got, good, it's just government, government, government. And we stood up, it was, uh, I think there were two young people there, it was me and some other young men, and we said, this is fundamentally wrong, the institutional framework. You need to have private sector in the framework where you are developing the policy. And we've been able to develop a more efficient mm -hmm. uh, strategy for the country and a more efficient master plan. Now, the bit of the challenge is what she brought up earlier. Is now we have done, and we've done it makes sense because it resonates with all the challenges of all the key sectors and uh, practical solutions in this. Now, supposed to now get adopted, stuck at the high, high level ministers offices able what we're able to do by just including the uh, in the institutional framework we're able to come with a policy that actually makes more sense to everyone so these aspects of shared value being covered is as private uh, sector if you're coming to say i should keep on uh, young entrepreneurs got margins that I need and so that when you are saying that I should empower you. I'll, I'll, I'll suggest that a deliberate investment into understanding the needs of the key players like she's just stated. You, in, you want a private sector to be in, invest when you're at a designing level, invest in that other than the approach of saying this is support that is coming, then you draw out all the plans and say oh, this is my partner and that is my partner but without really investing in, let's understand, let's emphasize first, understand the partner. Then you'll be able to come up with now better uh, way of how you're going to engage. Um, I'm going to just say shortly to just say, she was saying, I was going to say um, inclusion, private sector inclusion, make it at least 60-40 because in most times, government just comes in as a funder or at least holds money from funders. So if you could make it at least 60-40 with the private sector um, being more dominant and also making it having more young people and more innovators involved in the decision making and in implementation, that would really be good. And you have no more minutes. And, and you know, then the aspect of legitimacy comes in when you go to an organization and you've got backing of uh, the, the government coat of arms or the government flag, the government office. It's very easy to get the attention of, if say you're looking for funding, you want to go to Afriexim Bank, they listen to you more. So that legitimacy aspect is also built in. Uh, okay. Well.
ok? É, bom, mais uma vez, o, o nosso foco é, é muito sensível. Tem ali várias questões para a juventude. Mas é necessário é, metas concretas e execuíveis por parte do Executivo. E agora, o, o setor privado é um parceiro muito forte para o Estado, no que diz respeito ao apoio na empregabilidade, porque temos que contar mesmo com, em primeiro lugar, estimular, estimular a todo nível a vontade no surgimento de organizações e aquilo que anteriormente havia sido dito pelo, pelo meu colega é, é, há uma questão se uma determinada organização ou se eu tenho uma determinada iniciativa apesar de não cumprir o tempo de existência ou de cinco anos, de quatro anos não pode me impossibilitar de angariar, de ter acesso a, a certo financiamento, de poder realizar alguma ação específica. E a questão da criação de plataformas especializadas é, de mais diversos aspectos, ligada a, 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 a questões de empregabilidade, ligada às questões de sociais, as questões industriais. Com quem tem ações ligadas àquilo que eu quero realizar, no sentido de querer buscar inputs que, porque, e porque visamos os nossos interesses. A nível da SADEC, por exemplo, a nível da nossa região, os conselhos da juventude, por exemplo, devem melhorar, devem ter uma ação mais interligada entre os diferentes conselhos da juventude, no sentido de se alcançar metas e pressionar os governos para que as, as políticas ligadas à juventude possam sair do papel, sair dos gabinetes e irem para a prática. Porque eu, por exemplo, trabalho num, de, num departamento do Ministério. E se termos um olho mais técnico do gabinete, mais para funcionário, vamos ver que não, as políticas, os programas estão lá, nós pensamos positivamente, mas quando vamos para a comunidade, quando vamos para a prática das coisas, vamos ver que falhamos. Primeiro vamos ver que o próprio Estado, não há sensibilidade política ou não financia tal como devia financiar os programas e depois se cria o quê? Critérios de exclusão. O próprio sistema em si já se carrega de te excluir. Você, quando vais ver é, os critérios para que tenhas acesso a algum determinado financiamento, a um determinado programa, a uma determinada ação, você vai se auto-excluir. Então, os conselhos da juventude devem ter uma maior interação nesse aspecto e, acima de tudo, area of the interest. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned very important uh, issue of engaging uh, stakeholders. We talked about stakeholder analysis first, problem identification, the stakeholder an uh, engagement. Uh, usually in Africa, the problem one is that we request the engagement of experts or any other party after we had done what we want as government to be done. Or if it's a, it's a framework for implementation or a, a monitoring evaluation framework that we need to adopt in, the, in a certain department, we make that uh, framework first. Then we engage other stakeholders behind so that we, it, 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 it acted as if no the stakeholders' engagement was uh, at different level. But the most important part is that when engaging stakeholders, uh, it is from community level. Though private sec uh, uh, sector is important, but community level is also important because stakeholders of the community as well. Because if we only engage private sector, not uh, community, then the stakeholder at some point will not have to 
account for whatever activity that they are doing within that particular community. So the other thing is that when engaged these key players, also they have to be engaged also in the implementation of this uh, whatever framework or policy that is, 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 is ought to be, to, be, to be made. Because uh, if you don't implement, engage those that uh, created that policy or were, 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 were engaged in the creation of that policy, then it, may, it, may, it, it automatically means that that particular policy or strategy is going to fail. Because those who implemented it should be key players in, 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 in ensuring that this uh, 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 strategy or policy is implemented. Also, those uh, uh, stakeholders uh, automatically are also there to monitor if this policy or strategy is, is, is implemented. So it's a it's a win-win, like we said, a win-win situation. I think we are done, colleagues. Um, our rapporteur, who already. Huh? Okay, we can ask. Okay. How many more groups do we still have? Thank you, thank okay. you. Can we can we have the the rapporteurs, note takers, come and sit up here? The the representatives of the group. Okay. Are they all here, Antoinette? Okay. So um, we have two representatives. We need a third, fourth, fifth one. There are five groups. So where are the other representatives? <coughs> G? Okay, two more.
Okay. So maybe if we, if you don't mind, can we set in one, two, three, four? That will be easy for us because we have the topic group one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm okay here, so you can give him the mic and then pass it on. All right. So, um, th thank you very much for making all the adjustments. Uh, I, I, we have to thank uh, Antoinette for facilitating this in, to ensure that you know it can run smoothly, which is what we would like to see with the youth in charge. What typically happens? Um, uh, I'm really glad to see that. So, what we're going to do in this session? ask you to introduce yourself and uh, you take three to five minutes to give us advice of what was discussed in the in, in in the group meeting specific questions i think you have you know the charge because you, you are handling it so that's what i'll say so we're going to start uh with group one the top for group one was building capacity among young entrepreneurs in the reviewing the role of incubation hubs classes in youth and entrepreneurship development. All right, so you introduce yourself and then you, s you share with us what, what you're handling, what you're dealing with. My name is Lucky. Hi. Is it fine? Good afternoon. My name is Lucky Mujibu, uh, founder and CEO of Silaho Investments, and also um, a technical agricultural advisor at Nest Hubs which is an, incu uh, an incubation hub in Khabarone. Right, now regarding our topic um, of the challenges that we have with clustering and solution for, uh, we had an interesting participant in our room from Sib Hub, right? Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have any participants that brought forward problems but because all the problems um, are quite uniform, really, uh, we managed to draft up a solution very quickly. And that was through integrating uh, incubation hubs and partnering them up with uh, vocational facilities, being tertiary institutions mostly, as well as um, your basic education, I mean, sorry, your primary and secondary education facilities. Right, um, so SIP Hubs has a four-step, four-stage process really, which is an idea conceptualization, business plan conceptualization, plan formulation, uh, management of the business, as well as development of the enterprise. And what we've managed to put together is a solution uh, that we're addressing. Um, being that students are furnished with certain skills and it ends there. The journey ends there. There's no follow through. So being that the partnership between vocations and the hubs, while the students are still in vocation, it would be extremely conducive for them to enter the job market, not through internship, Right, but through practice, practice and exercise, right, stretching out into the communities what they've learned to further mentor those that didn't make it into those institutions of vocation, right. Um, the challenge with the communities, community facilities, be it agriculture, be it green space or digitization, we have policymakers that have um, strained processes of approving any uh, proposal. So by offsetting a legal demonstration, you will be reaching communities, various target groups. We're talking about the unemployed woman. We're talking about the community. If you're setting up a vegetable garden in the community, you roll them out. You give them that food security, right? The business community, is then as a partner of the hubs, but whereby the hubs really filter out if the business communities will not abuse those interns or the youngsters who are coming from vocational facilities. 
and I believe that's about that. Thanks. Thank you, Lucky. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, and then we're going on to Group 2, and the Group 2 looks at the role of higher education uh, institutions and entrepreneurship training and development. So introduce yourself, and then go into your, you know, your, your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Riyad Lehile Makati from Lesotho. I'm a student at the National University of Lesotho, the leader of all Lesotho from, from my country. Um, I'm also in the intra that is representing the National Council, um, representing all the youth of Lesotho. Our, um, our theme is the role of institutions in to develop skills so that students can become functional active members of education in the private sector. Um, we shift their minds, actually, the they also have to fairness implemented in the in, in in the private sector. Let's graduate, we should find a way to create awareness on how they can use what they learned in school to actually venture in the private sector. Um, still in awareness, education institutions also to invite those experiences. is an alien. And if they don't even know anything about it, they just see it by passing. Let's try to invite people who are already living that so experiences. By doing so, they can actually generate eagerness of uh, to the private system. We want to champion from the early there are where teachers are trained, teachers who are going to teach those students at the basic education. Teachers, student teachers, they should be taught in part actually We also, they are so doing, it teaches the basic education schools, particularly primary and secondary, to include the entrepreneurship uh, uh, subject in their own curriculum because it when somebody has to go to the university. Um, all delivery of content, it should help students to actually the content at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the school. And also, we need to have our own education system needs. You see that somehow we're still colonized. In most of the um, bring solutions or have in 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 our you 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 can compare what we learn in school and what the students in European countries learn. You see a huge difference. In some instances, we even learn things that do not even matter. We can even learn. Stakeholder partnerships and networks for youth empowerment organizations. Empowerment in that nature. Um, I was part of the group three, and I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis of what we discussed. So our approach to this topic was to start are aligned. So that's where we started. We started looking at um, 
uh, each, each, each sector to say, you know, from the perspective of government, it will be an issue of, well, uh, we do include youth, we've got the policy, but the youth got an, a lax attitude towards the uptake of those uh, as well. Um, I can't because they are youth. It needs to feed into my bottom line. It needs to feed into my KPIs. So uh, it needs to make sense. There has to be shared values being right. What is private sector with policies that they are had at policy level so that they isn't an element of your, your force feeding a solution. And that there will be that added value. For example, if you're going to say to the commercial banks, you need to prove beyond reasonable doubt that it's worthwhile to a bank like APSA, to a bank like FNB. So if you're able to include them and hear them, the challenges that they actually have, because it's very easy to point a finger at private sector, yet in their experience, we extended funding to, to youth is not being we speak about the challenges that so when we include each of the states at policy making level, we are really able to come up with an inclusive policy that can then be adopted and rolled not just the policy making aspect of it, is the adoption. So by including them at that fundamental level, you make it all out because we have a and is pretty part of it already surrounded. So that was our, 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 our approach and then uh, in enable is you find the stakeholders in a while at the conference they don't meet regularly where we are really saying, okay, agribusiness, what are we going to do about it? And you've got people from the private sector, you've got entrepreneurs, you've got institutions. If we are take up one, two, three, and find solutions, you've got the expertise who are, uh, uh, who are doctorates, Scott, yes, PhDs, evidence. And they're saying, we've got the energy and the appetite for it, but we are organization assist us here to move forward. And, 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 and into in terms of benefited uh, from this pro product, I actually meant to impact that be measurable and be evidence by even in the way that uh, our GDP earning is coming. If, if our biggest GDP and our, and our are mining and agriculture, how much of that agriculture comes from youth? We need to be able to really give numbers because that's when we will know for sure that all the stakeholder partnerships that we are building and the money there and the resources that we are putting, a lot of this money is taxpayer money. We are sure and we are confident that it's making an actual impact in our memberships and in our region. Thank you. Yeah, I, you, you talked about monitoring and evaluation. I, I think probably you are the first person to mention that today. It's very important. So, and you are, you are actually drilling down to the activity level. So, we may talk policy, but what we want to see is how, do we, how is that policy actionable? What are we doing to make sure that that policy is implemented? Uh, we are not short of policies in the context talk about Botswana, we are not short of policy. We have fantastic policies that can be and have been adopted before by others. So it's a question of how do we implement. So let's walk the talk. That's what you've been saying. And I think uh, your group, these groups have been doing a fantastic job. Thank you for sharing that. So G, it's your turn. Introduce yourself. And your group is actually uh, discussing how, you know, recovering from a pandemic, uh, the pandemic, uh, youth health, life skills, and well-being in the post-COVID-19 era. I know I know our group spent a lot of time on life skills, soft skills, and you, as somebody coming from Ministry of Health and Wellness, you know, reminded us that we need to be talking a lot more about mental health. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Huizwane Paswane. I'm from Ministry of Health and Wellness. I'm overseeing the youth matters in the ministry. So, uh, we asked three questions. 
start to contribute to was what was asked here. Um, our first question was, what types of skills and what types of skills youth need? Uh, these are life skills, soft skills. So we also wanted to find out, can this be provided with training? So we link these skills to specific employment activities. Uh, we also looked at the intervention programs and see how can they be linked to the funding organizations. Uh, like Prof said, we spent a lot of time talking of the life skills. So we also, the most important one here is the mental health. Uh, we, we are from COVID and the COVID is still there. So most of people are going through difficult times. Some have lost their jobs. Some have lost their businesses. Others have lost the family members that were supporting them and providing for uh, Even the children, some of them have lost their parents. So uh, it is important that mental health be incorporated in all aspects of social lives uh, and skills around. Uh, as Minister of Health in Botswana, we have what we call youth-friendly service clinics across the country. But uh, unfortunately, they don't cover the whole country, but they are in some districts. So all the youth health issues are attended there. You get to the clinic, you find a youthful nurse that will attend to you, provide you with all the needs that you want. We're talking prep, we're talking old reproductive health programs, you'll find them in those schools. Even the midwives, they, they are youthful. So, yeah. Uh, when it comes to skills, uh, we are saying that networking skills should be taught from an early age. Like they should be incorporated in the basic education curricula. So that when a kid, a youth comes from, from a very remote area and they come to the city, and when they he get here, they see too many lights and traffic. So sometimes it becomes difficult for them to adapt to the city life so they may end up losing it. Uh, uh, most of the higher education, the university, they offer orientation for the first years. So as part of orientation, there is need to improve social skills so that this youth who are being orientated on how the institution is like and how life is like in the city, they can adapt from an early stage. Uh, we also looked at the computer literacy, which, which forms part of ICT. Uh, we are saying that ICT also should be introduced uh, from an early age, from the primary schools, should be incorporated in the curriculum because uh, uh, the youth that are from the remote areas and the rural areas, they still have difficulties of PT, how to use the computer, and disadvantage them on how to access other services that are online. So we are also seeing that there is a need for support groups in schools so that uh, they learn and get support from 
the these groups that they fund in institutions. I know you know that we have the AA. So these support groups can also help uh, other students to survive and to adapt to the new environment that they are in. Uh, there is also a for the youth to shadow their role models or their career role models. This is trainers of trainees. Say, for example, from a young age, somebody wants to be a of young people. and the business um, we need to have also people who will be providing financial skills youth age um, so so sports and they should so Covered. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, looking at jobs for digital transformation, led by Dr. Uh, introduce yourself. And My name is Amani Dube. I'm the CEO and founder of Seacrest Investments, which is a digital and an our topic was um, creating decent and so perfect, but a decent job through just at the basic. Any job creation in the digital platform needs especially in the SADC region. Um, we are not privy to. It's a very, it's a very, very difficult one. Um, we noted that so um, about strengthening the econ the economic base first. Then there's job. Um, the improvement of infrastructure, the access to services, which is data which is something more very important because as soon as anyone is given an opportunity of information or transfer of information, it creates jobs automatically. The transfer of that, and, um, we also spoke about um, other countries such as China that uh, they're, they're most importantly, it's proper policies that we are really, really um, in need of, especially in the digital space. It's fairly new and in Africa, and there aren't any proper policies that have been placed, and that creates a lot of I'm when I started um, operating seven, eight years ago, government uh, didn't understand it, corporates didn't understand what what is she talking about. So it's that knowledge as well is important. And having sector driven having adaptation of, of policy um, the point that was made from the uh, plan is that um, created in digital unlike other policies let me put it this way unlike other policies that are, have been in place and have been put there Digital policies haven't been there because it's an unfamiliar platform and ground. So it does stand at advantage because it started with practice before the policies. Whereas in other sectors, it's the po the policies came before the practice, which didn't then speak to youth development and youth um, growth. Um, in conclusion, oh, not in conclusion, and also um, to highlight, in order for us. Africans um, to create jobs that make sense, even digitally. We need to digitalize our own things.
digitalize our own ideas. As Africans digitalize, there's a lady who made an example of the Mobano words. Digitalize it. Let's start digitalizing our own, um, uh, our own ideas, our own businesses, our, uh, our, our very own Africans, even in policy creation. African youth. And it starts becoming exciting in that way. And it will have more and more youth being driven towards um, engagements of entrepreneurship, engaging in wanting to do more and being excited about such things and pull, pull, pull them away from the easier things. Entrepreneurship is not an easy, um, a, a, an easy road, but if you start digitalizing, uh, digitalizing the concepts and making them feel as their own and not a far-fetched, um, you know, ideology that belongs to some other person. So this is a great way for us Africans as well to have a, a, a blank canvas through digitalization. digitalization. It's a blank canvas for us. And in that way, if we just start from the bottom, from the bottom line, because the roots is always important, creating and strengthening the that was nice. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I can tell you how exciting it is to me at talent and uh, sharing the discussion from the group. And I know that they had an input uh, to us. We'll take questions. to type. Recommendations for listen, no essay, nothing complicated, bullet points on specific recommendations. Put them over your phone and send them as a text to Mr. Man. Please do by tomorrow, uh, be in the morning or this evening if you can do it so that they, uh, Mr. Mamela um, and Tony, what did we say? Maybe this evening, tomorrow morning, is it realistic? Yeah. So that you can integrate that into tomorrow's uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I know that we have an interview and the second panel is looking at the future of Africa in Kabul. The panel has just recently spoken there are two sessions. But so this this these are the demographics that we have for this meeting of the the leaders. Okay. Exactly. Is that is it a difficult ask? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me, I'll call you, uh, come to come over. Uh, let's take comments, questions to the groups. Is there any? Yeah, thank you. Reflections from your observations. Prof. The mic is there. Yeah, it's, it's a quick general one and, and maybe applies even from the deliberations and the presentation from this morning. I haven't had any discussion about um, the need for land, the importance of land and land access. Most of our governments would be talking about uh, that presentation this morning about the fact that there's need to Make uh, to venture a little bit more and push the youth more in the direction of agriculture, but there wasn't um, a lot of discussion and talk about um, land accessible for the youth to work from. Um, yeah, I, I I want to hear from the youth. Touched on it. All right. Yeah. To give to give my panelist um of land for a Honda Fit or uh, a small sum of money, but then again it goes to what Dr. J is saying. <laughs> that issue 
as a woman. Cool. I've got pictures, you know, it also needs to speak to us as well. The biggest problem is not the, uh, the land or the access per se, it's our mentality and our notion. If we can start that, I believe that we'd go and just not doing this thing. What we want to do is build capacity and incorporate the renewable energy that you're speaking about. Now when we talk about independent, independent solar producers that we are now being able to in Botswana, does anyone here know the criteria and the requirements in terms of costs for you to get that license, first of all? It's not anyone who can be able to access. Already there, there's so many barriers to entry. So what we want to do, first of all, is access the land so that we are able to really incorporate all these elements. Because with a smart city, what we're essentially doing is being very equitable about land. Understanding that because land does not uh, uh, grow, it will always be the same portion of land that you got there. How do you make it more productive in terms of making sure? Even if I've got like 10 hectares or 20 hectares, we build homes in there, we build a hospital in there, build um, uh, shops and everything in there. So it becomes very productive. People walk to work. They, they, there's less uh, emissions of energy. And we are, even in terms of uh, the, the water sanitation system, there's no water that is wasted. So on its own, those smart cities really address a lot of those other issues that we are trying to drive towards. But without that access to land, we can't get. And the issues that we have here in Botswana is the land tenor. Because I can have a 20 hectare thing that I can either build a multi residential on it, or I can, I can um, you know, and, uh, if I give an example, really about the, the growth areas, just the outskirts of the city, it's mostly farmlands wow. owned by the average one. And let's bit of access to land, especially here in Botswana. It's there. The average household has three land. They've got the, the farm, which, which we and then we've got the which we call Masini. The average household has a bit of access to land. It might not necessarily my father has land. The land, but the land, the this land. Any de development finance with a piece of land that is undeveloped, can I can't cover the money. You know, they're not in funding for that kind of. Uh, and most of us youth really we don't have the sort of assets that can serve as as collateral. So th it, this is a very big issue. I'm very happy you brought it up, and it was very very almost reckless of us as youth to forget this. We should have brought it up ourselves as youth. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, she um for the sake of a clean energy question. I, yeah, Anne was asking she had not heard anything about renewable energy and what and I think uh, both touched on that on the complexity of the issues. But even though I think the responses have been provided about what they said, we know they are complex. But what we are saying is that when you are res resilient, when you are ambitious when you, um, you, know, you have the world without, you would actually overcome those challenges and continue going. So the, the tricky part of, of my challenge is you're going to face these regulatory frameworks that are constraining, da, 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 da. but let's shoulder on, let's find a way to keep going. And this is a conversation I keep on saying when I'm in Cape Town, Botswana, Ghana, and we're going to lose family because the allowance that you are supposed to receive. Um, you have not yet, but we are so that in the morning, and this still concerns the, the delegates coming from outside. In the morning, the it will be difficult Well, I think it's it's always safe to understand from both, as you are saying, Paul. Okay, yeah, let so me help you there. Who's helping? <laughs> yes, because <laughs> she's here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know about other countries, but uh, you are going to need to 
do the PCR. If you do it tomorrow, uh, depending where you are testing, I don't know, have you in this yeah, the private? The facilities will be coming here for to do the tests. Is it the government of? No, it's a private one. Is the so if the if it's a private, the possibility of you getting the results tomorrow afternoon is very high. Yes. Or the latest that we can get them is Wednesday. Eh? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying, or maybe tomorrow. But that's what you're saying. Eh. Okay. So they will get them yes. tomorrow. Eh, so they will be valid for 72 hours. Thank you so very much. Then there's a small question that we, since we are the youth to talk, able to network. So um, please uh, feel free. Prof, can I have the send it to Professor? Yeah, Sadak is requesting that you bring along your boarding passes as well. If you've got any receipts, those should also be brought with you. So boarding passes are important if you're going to be reimbursed. So bring your boarding passes as well. <laughs> 